We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Atque Semper Virgo Felix Semporta Everybody, it's Steve with Sense Fidel. I'm coming at you with the 200th episode of Resistance Podcast. Who would have thought we would have done more than two? We're at 200. And with us is Ryan Grant. Welcome, Ryan, from Media Actors Press. Guest partner, host, whatever you want to call it, on the rundown with me. And uh, overall, great guy. Ryan, welcome. How you doing, Wayne? I'm doing great. Uh, some people might dispute the overall great guy bit, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on here. No, 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 no problem. So Ryan came up with this idea for some doctor of the church that some people may or may not have heard about, Robert Bellarmine. Why is he important for today? This will be recorded. This is getting put up on the 17th of September. Is there a reason that we're doing this? Yeah, so the 17th September is actually the 400th anniversary of St. Robert Bellarmine's death. And as in uh, September 17th, 1621. So it, 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 this being the, the anniversary of his um, coming into life, uh, he thought it'd be a great occasion to, to talk about... Um, his holiness, because a lot of people just simply don't know a lot about him, or if they have heard anything, typically, unless they've seen me talk about him before, they're hearing about a certain issue that occupied a very minimal part of his corpus that he thought was just a passing comment, wasn't interested in. Galileo! Not even going to get, yeah, not, not that either. <laughs> yes, that would be the other thing people would have heard of him from Galileo. So, um, but, but typically in Catholic circles, it happens to be this other discussion that I'm not going to get into, as I've said, all I'm going to say on that subject. <laughs> yeah, every time you bring up Bellarmine, he goes, Senator McCartney, Senator McCartney, Senator McCartney. So, <laughs> man, that's like a chapter. He's got a book that you could kill somebody with. with it's so heavy. Uh, so why like is he even important? The whole thing. So if, if if you want to know more about that, you can find my discussion with Taylor Marshall on that subject. Uh, because I'm probably not ever going to address it again. So <laughs> that's my, 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 it's not the last word on it for sure, but it is my last word. So who is he? He, he is like the apologist right. of apologists. So. So, uh, so many different uh, uh, avenues to discuss, but uh, biographically, St. Robert was born in the 16th century, 1542, on uh, St. Francis's feast day, October 4th. He was, um, you know, part of a, a noble family, Montepulciano is the name of the city he was born in. And there, there's a lot of mythology and tradition about the history of the city that it was a Roman city that was actually in a different place, a place called Clusium, and that was destroyed in an earthquake. And so the the story goes from the medieval chroniclers that the uh, the nobility moved up the mountain and, and settled the city, and the common people who weren't part of the nobility went and founded another city nearby. So Montepulciano's where the nobility went, but um, you know they, they weren't you know, all exactly wealthy. So as that descends down through the course of time, um, there is a fellow named Marcello Trevini, Cardinal Marcello Trevini. He was a uh, fantastic reforming cardinal, had zero human respect, did not care what uh, the prevailing powers wanted. He was just about reforming the church. And so when the first Jesuits came around to Rome, he was really excited about these guys. And, and they showed the promise to, unlike today, to, to reform the church and fix things and um, and just the absolute holiness and dedication and purpose. So he got attached to them really quickly. And so there was one of them, a French secular priest that had uh, pronounced his vows into the hands of St. Ignatius named Pascal Sproe. I'm not even sure the proper spelling of his name, B-R-O-E with an umlauf uh, T. Uh, but anyway, so Pascal Sproe was a, um, <clears throat> he, he'd done all kinds of amazing adventures actually through Scotland and Ireland. So Trevini makes him part of his, uh, uh, staff and on the way to the Council of Trent, they stop and they uh, in this in his home city of Montepulciano. Now Trevini had a, a sister named Cynthia, and so he had labored to to marry her to to um, 
a man of good morals. And so they had found one Vincenzo Bellamino. And so the two of them get married. And then after several children, they have St. Robert. And so uh, at some point when Robert was a, a child, uh, is this uh, one of the first Jesuits, Pasquez Broeg, would have uh, met them when he was there with uh, Marcello Trevini. And at that time, he gave a conference. And uh, his, so St. Robert's mother, Cynthia, uh, immediately conceived in her heart that, um, you know, one of my sons will be a Jesuit. He was this order of reforming priests are true priests, amazing priests. And one of them has to join it. And so she would visit them at their chapel, Loretto, and she'd, uh, you know, make retreats with them. Retreats were a brand new thing in those times. You didn't, um, you hadn't, hadn't, hadn't had those for the life of the church. You'd have like conferences and things like that. Preachers would come out and preach, but you'd never have this idea of taking like special days, especially as a lay person. And uh, having a, like a devoted period of prayer and whatnot. Um, but anyway, so St. Robert's mother was was extremely holy. Uh, she had a mania for giving alms. It's one of the things that St. Robert relates in his uh, autobiography. And it's also noted in some of the early sources as well. So, so she's always given alms, but their family was so poor, they could have used them themselves. And so Vincenzo, St. Robert's father, is like, you know, if, if God doesn't help us, I don't know what's going to happen because we don't have anything. So a lot of large families today know that plight and how things will just kind of all of a sudden turn around and the finances all work out somehow, even though you have no idea how it worked. So, and this is often what happened uh, for St. Robert's family. Now, so when he was born, one of the things uh, Bartoli, one of his early biographies, tells us is that he used to practice saying Mass at home. And he had his sisters make him some little kid vestments. And so he would wear those and practice saying Mass as a boy. And then he'd set up a stool and start preaching to all his siblings, even the ah. older ones. And uh, according to Bartoli, it had a great effect on them. Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, nobody knows if he had, um, you know, because he's writing about uh, 50, 60 years later, uh, Bartoli's biography. I'm not sure where he got the information, if that was a tradition of the order. Uh, there, There's reference to it in the canonization documents, but um, it's one of those things that's very likely, but not terribly well documented. So for at least not contemporaneously. But anyway, you know, it would presage things to come. So as he got older, he uh, his health was always problematic. In fact, it was feared that he would die young. But he didn't, and he actually and he ended up living till he was almost 80. Um, never perfectly healthy, never absolutely sick and miserable. It was always a, his health was always broken, but never absolutely destroyed. Um, and, of course, and they, they thought he'd drop off at about seven. So he does make it through, and he decides because of his various health maladies that he wanted to be a doctor, which made his father happy because doctors did earn a good deal of money in those days. So... It, uh, so they kind of made preparations for him to get apprentice that would get him set up to uh, take a medical, uh, medical degree or something like that. But something else happens, uh, namely that the Jesuits roll into Montepulciano and started their own school. And so uh, Bellarmine's parents transfer him over there. And now we've got to say a word about schooling in those times. Um, in Italy, it was often the case that poor and, uh, you know, uh, disenfranchised children had access to schools run by the church. Uh, some were hit and miss on, uh, on how well one was versus the other, but this is also the case in medieval England. This is the case in France. Uh, you have free grammar schools run by monks, and uh, at different times, sometimes there are boardings. You know, any anywhere you had to pay, typically that's where you're finding you know noble children. Um, and if you had the determination and the drive and the intelligence, you'd go on and master your course of study, which really is Latin. That's what you studied, was Latin. And through the study of Latin, you did everything else. So it's kind of loosely based on the medieval trivium system where you have, you learn logic, and then you learn, uh, sorry, you learn grammar, Latin grammar, how to speak in Latin. You learn logic, how to speak, uh, you know, correctly and make correct arguments. And rhetoric, which is how to sound really good while you do the other two. And... Um, and in the course of this whole study of Latin, you're also learning history, you're learning literature, uh, poetry, you know, through Virgil and the great classics. You're, um, you know, you're picking up all these different disciplines all through Latin, even mathematics, actually. So it, that's your quadrivium, uh, arithmetic, essentially is what it was. They said mathematics, but it was arithmetic, astronomy, music, et cetera. So the... Um, so these are the things that St. Robert was learning. He excelled at them, actually. Um, and then so the, and the Jesuits were actually extremely good. They had uh, all their methods of teaching were drawn, drawn from the University of Paris, where the original Jesuits uh, received their doctorates.
And they, they were very excellent methods of teaching, even in the grammar schools. And so they um, they opened up various schools. And so that they were trans uh, Bellarmine and his uh, siblings were transferred over there. But it started a mini war, actually, because um, you know, a lot of the other teachers are like, hey, these Jesuits, they don't charge any fees. And this is true even of the Roman college itself. You, you could board at the Roman college and take classes and the Jesuits didn't charge any fees because they felt that education should be free. Um, you tell that to the Jesuit run universities today <laughs> at uh, what is it? A hundred grand a year, 80 grand a year to go That's to some of these start. places <laughs> <laughs> for an undergraduate. Um, but that's how uh, it worked. And so like the Roman college in, uh, in Rome itself was uh, probably the first institution since the very founding of the city to, uh, to offer, you know, education in, in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin for free. You know, it, it, so anyway, so in Montepulciano, this starts a war. And Bellarmine distinguishes himself by giving a public oration on the, the values of, of the, the school, the excellence of the teachers, and, what, and it was so good that the, his, the person who was supposed to debate the other side in this public disputation on, on the Jesuits having a school there, he chickened out because he knew he couldn't speak as well as St. Robert could in Latin, huh. and which resulted in a lot of other parents transferring their kids over there, right? But there's something else that happens at this time, too, which is namely that St. Robert starts to realize a vocation. And... And he's, so he asks the, the Jesuits, uh, you know, a pointed question. And the background for this question is uh, his uncle, we mentioned earlier, Marcello Trevini, right, one of the great cardinals, reforming cardinals, great figure of the Council of Trent in its first phase. Um, he had been elected pope, okay, Pope Marcellus II. And in he, this was celebrated. This is a new age for the church. We finally have the man that's going to, to reform everything and fix everything. And he was absolutely set to it. You know, all his cousins are putting on silk because they figure they're going to be made cardinal soon. And he hears about it. He sends a letter. You are not allowed to even approach the city uh, and under pain of excommunication. Get the dang silk off. <laughs> you know? You're not going to be made a cardinal just because you're my relatives. Forget it. So um, anyway, after 30 days, he dies. And this had a really profound effect on Bellarmine. What, what's the point of obtaining earthly offices or riches? Um, you know, like my uncle was Pope and celebrated and revered by everyone, and now he's dead. So how is uh, this? This isn't a good thing. Um, all honors and earthly honors, what are the points? So he asks the Jesuits about some of the nature of their life, and they, and they say, well, you know, we're, we're not allowed to accept ecclesiastical dignities. We're not allowed to take higher honors except under obedience. So we don't strive to honor because we have vowed never to accept them. And then, um, you know, St. Robert thinks about that, and he realizes that's where he wants to be. So he asks one of the, the, the Jesuit priests, you know, how they find things in the, um, in the society, that is the Society of Jesus, and he tells them, contentis, you know, they're absolutely perfect. They're as, I'm as content as I could be. So that, that settles it for him. But now there's one more obstacle, namely his father. So this is absolutely his mother's, you know, this is what she's always wanted, is for him to become a Jesuit. And now there's the problem that his father refuses, you know, because for his father, him getting a medical degree, this is his hope for the salvation of his family. They're going to have lots of money flowing in, and finally they'll be able to live according to their state in, instead of like poor beggars. And, um, and and now it's not going to be. And, and so he, he looks at it, and it's a problem because he's a reasonably pious man in his own way. And so then he suggests, all right, well, if you're going to be a priest, why don't you go into the Dominicans? Because the Dominicans, they've had a lot of people, a lot of cardinals, a lot of bishops, a lot of popes, you know, some popes. That would be a great order to join. And, um, you know, he's uh, St. Robert tells his father, the very reasons you're urging me, you know, are the very reasons I, I want to join the Jesuits. I don't want any of that stuff. And so there's a stalemate. And so his father refuses to, uh, to allow him to, to, to speak to the Jesuits or go to their masses or anything. Now he's got to go to, he makes them go to the, to the Dominican church there or, or the diocesan church in town. Um, he refuses to anything. There, and the stalemate continues. And then he notices that his wife is suffering terribly. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't attack him or assault him or argue with him. She just spends her time in prayer and fasting. And he notices at one point that she's gone like a week without food. And he says, uh, so he relents and he says, all right, 
you can, you will allow this. And then he, you know, is tearfully because he knows the last hope for his family to do well is kind of is going off on the road now. But the first thing he does is he wants, he writes to um, Father Lane. He's one of Bellarmine's cousins in the Trevini site also uh, felt the same way. And so they were going to join together. So he writes Father Lanyas, Diego Lanyas, who the, now is the superior general of the order after um, Ignatius of Loyola's death. And he's, I offer you my sons, but I would like them to be tried to make sure this isn't just a bit of whimsy, that they actually are serious about this. So they arranged it so that they could, in, in kind of loosey-goosey, because after Trent got in place, you couldn't do this anymore. Um, he, we'll make this year where they're living up here, they're novitiate. So they were segregated in, in uh, with a relative that had a wonderful villa. And, you know, by a by a river, a big flowing river, and they would spend a year there, to, you know, talking and conversing, living a prayer life and and to, to discern if this is really the course that they're going to take. Which is to make sure it's not it's not whimsical, this grand idea, we're going to do this. And so they do it. And then there, it's by what used to be a, um, I believe, a Kamaldese uh, monastery. And there's still some Kamaldese monks there at the time. So there's a river called El Vivo. And it, which means the living one, they, they, that it's alive. Right? And that's what they would call the river because it's just a, a powerful moving um, you know, river, which sounded wonderfully in the local uh, area. It was like this idyllic Tuscan landscape, landscape, like paradise itself. And you'd have to be insane to want to leave there or called by God out of such things. And so, that, and that was kind of the the design. So they they spent a lot of time there with their relatives and and, and prayed and, and and debated philosophy and and whatnot. Bellarmine tells us this time that he burned poetry that he had written because he was ashamed to have written it because he's writing it in, in the imitation of the Roman poet Virgil. And he was so good at Latin too at this point that he's he could write in. Um, in, in, in following all the rules of poetry, which are very complicated, using only vocabulary that Virgil himself would have used, not not medieval vernacular Latin or other things. So um, anyway, this time, you know, probation passes and then his father comes to to again uh, test his vocations. And, you know, are, are you sure you don't want to do this and why don't you do this and this? And at last, you know, he, he has to give up. This is what he wants to do. This is probably what God is calling him to do, and I can't stand in the way. So that first phase of his life is over, and in, in uh, 1560, uh, then, you know, he makes his way down to Rome and, uh, and and knocks on the door of the Jesuit house and is received there. They made, they profess uh, their first vows, spent about two weeks, you know, in a retreat, and then they went to go prove themselves in the, the kitchen cleaning pots and pans, right? And they had to do this gruesome work. Now, they think about it today, too, um, especially in a large institution where there's a lot of people. Uh, you have large pots. They get greasy. So what do you do? You get degreasing soaps and all these things. You just squirt it in there. You got hot water, right? You just pour it in. The kitchen work in those days mean you are fetching the water. Uh, and you are boiling sufficient quantities to get the pots and pans clean in a timely manner. You don't have this nice liquid soap. You have the, these soaps that you have to, you know, agitate into to, to getting them to, to work. And you've got to beat a lot of stuff in, in the waters. And then you've got to scrub to get this grease off. It's it's hard, backbreaking work without the conveniences of just turning on a faucet and having that water come. So, and this is a man who in his entire life, you know, he's only, he's still only 18. And his entire life has been in studies and scholarship for the most part. But, you know, he, he goes right to it. So because one of the, the the principles for the Jesuits is being prompt to obey, right? And, and immediate, the, the obedience is blind. You're told to do it, and you're going to do it. And this is, this is the meaning of that phrase that St. Ignatius gives, is that for you, if the superior general commands it, you know, black is white and white is black, if that's what you're told. That's, and it's a peculiar notion of obedience that is to the Jesuits themselves. It's not the definition of obedience in, ter in terms of, like, everything in the church, right? So... This is, a, but this is one of the, the vows he taken. So one of the things that St. Robert is distinguished in from this very beginning all the way to his dying days is being prompt to obey in any, any way he was commanded. So he, um, you know, then goes on to the Roman college and begins the studies, which uh, wouldn't end except with his death, which were principally in Aristotle. And, uh, and in those days too, in education, it was Aristotle for science and Aristotle for ethics, and Aristotle for math, and Aristotle for um, 
whatever you were dealing with there, you did Euclid for math, but he had also Aristotle there. I mean, whatever it was, it, that's he's principally the one you're studying. And so they'd have to read him in Latin daily and they'd have to uh, make a commentary on Aristotle. And plus, when in the lecture halls, usually, like this is how it worked in Salamanca, the, the master would lecture. And then some of his uh, students, who weren't yet doctors, but were going that way, would summarize what he had said in the lecture. Yeah, uh, to, to, to double check. And of course, you didn't go to Walmart for paper because it didn't exist. And you didn't have, I mean, paper was expensive. You know, it was thick and, and it was uh, not so much, you, you couldn't just go in and take notes. So your memory had to be really sharp. And St. Robert was gifted with a photographic memory. And this aided him tremendously. And so he gets through his uh, philosophical studies and, uh, and he gets his, his Master of Arts. And he's um, already on, on his way to uh to brilliant his disputations on aristotle are, are are considered the best various professors would stop and ask him to defend various points of really complicated issues in aristotelian teaching and bellarmine never really had an interest in philosophy for its own sake uh and likewise politics or any of these other things it was he was most interested in the faith and defending the faith and everything he's doing is prepping him for theology at least he hoped so he gets really sick and they decide, well, let's get him back to his native era and that will help him out a bit. So he's sent with the Jesuits in Florence. And then what they do is they have him start preaching. And this is a confusing thing for modern uh, people because you never see somebody preach unless they're at least a deacon and above. But um, in those days, you could have somebody preach. And as long as they got the faculty from the bishop, it didn't. there was no canon that said they had to be in orders to do it. So, so they'd send him around preaching and then send him along with a Jesuit father who would hear the confessions that would result from his preaching. And it just became that uh, he became famous everywhere um, and, and in demand everywhere, consequently, for his preaching. And so, and this is still, this is in the 1560s where this is going on. And so just, just continuing to preach, get uh, sent in. Uh, he gets, he tells us in his autobiography that he was, um, taken with this, uh, the, this this what they call the stilo alto, the um, the high style, the high mind, the lofty style. And what this would be is when you would give orations or you'd be preaching, you would try to stuff it with as many puns and as many, uh, you know, classical allusions and literary tricks as you possibly could. And then for a sermon, I mean, it's one thing if you're, you're going to do this for like a speech amongst people who are going to get a lot of it. But doing this in a sermon for average people is really just vanity. And this is what St. Robert discovers through the process. And so it's like, on the one hand, objectively, the style of preaching was very beautiful, but it wasn't, you know, it just wasn't right. So he gets, um, you know, in this position, he preached for Christmas. And he had told um, a fellow Jesuit leader in life, Father uh, Andrew Ioannis um, Udaimon, who was a, a Cretan Jesuit, he had said that St. Robert told me he could memorize a sermon of about an hour's length by reading it once. So the, uh, but with this, you, you know, over he 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Um, so sorry, he had to sorry work, for uh, derailing that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to get to work on this, this, this larger endeavor to preach in the cathedral, uh, in Florence for, uh, for Christmas. And he does, and it has all these puns and illusions and all these things that make the, you know, and everyone kind of, you know, marvels, very educated audience that that listens. But then um, the cathedral canons invite him to go preach the next day. And he says, oh, darn, well, I can't possibly produce another one of these things. It took me weeks to get all these illusions, all these things, literary devices, all correct. So he just scrapped the whole thing and just preached from his heart. And then the canon said, yesterday we heard but a man, but today we heard an angel preaching. Uh, that is on St. Stephen's Day. And from that moment, Bellarmine says in his autobiography, I decided to abandon this lofty style and just preach from my heart with devotion as, as I was always always felt I should be doing. And, and, and that's what makes him actually, principally, he was the, one of the more famous preachers. Um, St. Charles Borromeo was trying to recruit him to go to Milan because they figured that this is the thing we want to do. We want to get this guy up here and uh, you know, preaching. But uh, what instead happens is he gets sent to Piedmont, Right, which is in the north uh, western part of Italy, uh, and then it actually was its own kingdom at the time, Savoy. Right, so they um, they send him up there to uh, to Genoa, and on the way he has uh, some interesting adventures. And of course, the um, they give him not even nearly sufficient money in order to make his way, because part you know part of the thing if you're into vow poverty, you've got to feel its pinch. 
And so he details some reports to the superior generals to show how he conducted himself and dealt with his, he dealt with the money on his way, but he was sent alone. And he gets into one place, uh, he goes into an inn to seek lodging. And immediately, uh, some woman did, uh, declares that he is the long absent husband of, the, <laughs> of her daughter. And, um, you know, if he gets saved at the last minute, somebody says, no, 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 he's a Jesuit. I know this man and um, I've seen him you know, in these other places. So he gets uh, freed from this really messy situation. Again, he's at, in sermons, St. Robert always mocks inns. It's one of the, he's always making fun of innkeepers because um, get some jokes at their expense because of the various practices they would go through in those times. It's not like nice, merry old men, like you think in, um, in Lord of the Rings, Butterbur's in the, the prancing pony, right? And he's also nice and he's bringing them all this food and stuff and provide for them all these things. Um, it's not the way inns typically worked in those days. So then he gets uh, on a ship. He does manage to get to get over to Genoa um, after a long time and a lot of uh, difficulties. And I'll, I'll, always God supplied at the moment when he needed it, some money and some, some means to, to get there. So he gets into Genoa. And he's supposed to teach this boys' school. And he was supposed to get some rest, according to Father Polacco, who is the, the new superior at the time of the, the society. And so what happens is he's supposed to get rest, but he's supposed to teach several classes a day. He's supposed to run spiritual retreats. He's supposed to preach in the town. He's supposed to do all these things that are basically an easy to be busy all day. Um, and on top of that, he looks at the schedule and he's supposed to teach Demosthenes the Greek, as in he's supposed to give lectures in Greek to help you understand Demosthenes. And St. Robert had to write back and say, well, I don't know Greek. I just know the alphabet. And they said, well, we're, we're, we're sure you'll manage. <laughs> so, you know, so once again, saved by his photographic memory. So he uh, starts the class and says, now we're, we're going to review what we learned last year. So he gets to work on that. And, and, and then everything is teaching is what he read the night before. And so for the, uh, the foreseeable, you know, next couple of weeks, he's reading ahead to to stay ahead of them, and and, and then teach uh, the review courses on these things, and then as uh, after a couple of weeks, he was as proficient in Greek as any master, and then um, you know taught not just not just uh, Demosthenes, but even more difficult texts by Socrates. So uh, just boom. Just like that, he, he was such a genius. He could do things like that. He did it again with Hebrew when he's in Louvain, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so he goes around and he's preaching and he's um, in an important fixture in the, in the area. And he's sent to theological studies at Padua, which uh, he talks about in his autobiography. Again, it becomes a really celebrated figure. And then the call comes for him to take off and head toward the, Nether the, the Spanish Netherlands to go to Louvain. Now, this this girl helped created a whole ton of consternation. They actually tried like a medical veto and all these things. But Bellarmine finally writes the superior general says, no, 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 I'm, I'm quite able to go. So he takes off actually with some famous figures like Cardinal Allen, for example, who is the founder of the English College of Dewey. And so he and several other prelates, they make their ride up, uh, you know, through France into um, the Spanish Netherlands, where they take up at Leuven. And so St. Robert, they, they knock on the door and St. Robert says, the Superior General sent me to you for two years, but I shall be here for seven. And it would, and that's exactly what happened. So somebody remembered that and asked him later, well, why'd you say that? He's like, well, it just came into my head. And this happens a number of times throughout his life where he, he literally predicts the future, but he thinks nothing of it at the time. It just came into his head. And so it's very much like the gift of prophecy, especially because it wasn't attached to it either. It doesn't make a, it, it just, just, just an idea he had, right. Which, which turns out to be correct. So he was called there because they, they had a course of sermons preached in Latin and in Leuven was an area of like six or seven different languages. So everybody learned at least enough Latin to get by, not just the students. And um, so, so they sent him up there to, to preach and, you know, so this is, they, then they realized wait, wait, you sent us a guy who's not a priest. And, you know, it wasn't the custom because Leuven was trying to, you know, they, the university there had been on the cusp of uh, church reform for a while, for the most part. And it wasn't customary for anyone to preach that wasn't in orders, at least. So um, they, uh, they write to the Jesuit superiors and they, they work it all as a Fran St. Francis Borgia, actually, um, who became the superior general at that point. He ends up approving it and saying, yep, yeah, go ahead and, and uh ordain him. So after, uh, you know, all the other minor orders and whatnot, which they gave rather quickly, but diaconate in the next year, they ordained him on 25th March. Um, I believe the year was 1573. 
And so on the Feast of the Annunciation, which in that year was actually during, uh, it was right before Holy Week. And so then he became, uh, you know, a, a priest and then was was uh, sent up to preach. So he, uh, and you could tell this was a very fun date for him because he preached a number of sermons several times in different collections on the Annunciation and on the gospel that's read on that day, Mrs. Estangelus. So he would preach just on that theme and a good number of sermons about it. So um, nevertheless, there, there's all kinds of fun little stories here. So Leuven, there, there, a lot of people are fairly tall. Bellarmine was about a five foot tall Italian Jesuit. He was very short, um, even shorter than my wife is. My wife was complaints about being too short. And I would say, well, Bellarmine was two inches shorter than you. <laughs> He, All my um, cousins are tiny. We feel like Shaquille O'Neal around them. <laughs> right. He, um, so he would get in the church. And so the one, this is a big problem because if he stood in the pulpit just on the floor, but you wouldn't be able to see his head. So he sets up a stool there and stands on it and preaches from that stool. And he seemed larger in life to the people. You know, people did not recognize him uh, when they met him in the street versus in the pulpit because he seemed like such a different person. He had such gravitas when he was preaching. Other people talk about uh, his face glowing, almost like a luminous light behind him while he was preaching. Uh, Protestants came and heard him preach and and were converted, actually, in due course, or a good number of them, uh, just from him preaching and led Luva. And then he goes, you know, further to to um, you know, there, there's another story he tells in the autobiography where he's walking on the because the Jesuit house was a bit of a ways from the Church of Saint Michael. We, we believe it was destroyed in World War One, or maybe during the um, some of the wars of France much earlier. But uh, anyway, he had um, so he's on his way, and there's another guy, you know, say, hey, have you you know heard this new cathedral preacher and, and this new church preacher from Italy? And uh, Bellarmine says, oh, yes, I have. <laughs> he doesn't talk about him. And then uh, they tried some conversation. And then he finally says, well, uh, you know, you're, I, I'm going to move along to get there faster. You know, otherwise I won't have a seat. Um, I, I don't know where you're going to find a seat. And he says, oh, don't man- don't worry. They'll manage for a little fellow like me. <laughs> <laughs> he was always great with jokes. He loved guy. puns. He uh, he would have uh, actually he told the equivalent of what today we call dad jokes, <laughs> and and he <laughs> got quite a bit of uh, humor out of it. He uh, there was another time where a um, a Dominican had requested to see them, and uh, some of the Jesuits, and so they he was there with um, a with, with a, I believe it was a superior, and the Dominican starts making you know, jokes. Oh, this little fellow here, I'll be glad of a drink. And kind of it mocks him a little bit, not realizing this is the priest that's preaching at the at the um, in the, that, that so famously. So the same Dominican comes in the next day uh, and asks to 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 speak to the the preacher, and in Bellarmine, of course, is like, well, I'm afraid he can't come down. And then, uh, but I can take him a message for you. And then uh, the, the Dominican's like, no, 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 I, I need to talk just to him. So if you can go fetch him. And Bellarmine's in this kind of, a, he's trying to avoid, <laughs> and, he, and he, he needs, he's trying to stay humble and not, you know, he's like, well, no, I, I can't go fetch him, but I can certainly take him a message. And the priest says, nope, my business is only with the preacher and no one else. And then he gets, some little, gets a little heated. And finally, St. Robert says, since you must know, I am the cathedral preacher. The reason I could not take him a message is because I am already here. <laughs> and then and then the priest said he realized and apologizes for belittling him the day before, not realizing who he was. But uh, they come to good friends, and Bellarmine gives conferences to the Dominicans. He gives a number of conferences around to his brethren. And he also ends up running um, the Jesuit college at Leuven. And one of the things he does is that it, um, it's one of the first times this was done outside, say, the Dominican order, is he dispensed with the reading of the sentences of St. Peter Lombard. So for theology, when you studied theology, you studied the, the various books of sentences of Peter Lombard, which were di- different disputations on uh, various points. And so you'd read the books of the sentences, or four of them, and and they have you know, disputations and all sorts of different um topics in theology so you then when you got when you finished you know studying all these questions and learning and the the masters expound upon them you would write a commentary on it in order to get your doctorate and so and that's typically how theology works so bellarmine what he does instead he substitutes that with the summa theologia of saint thomas aquinas and, and again this had not been done outside the dominican order before let alone in a major university so 
and that's what he, he used to train his students. And they actually remarked uh, with the, the, you know, how much uh, more quickly they learned all these things. And it, it was a truly amazing feat for them. Um, but then, the, you know, the major, the first major crisis that Bellarmine ever has to deal with is with a guy named Bias or Michel Dubé. Michel Dubé actually had been a delegate at a theologian at the Council of Trent and sat there with the fathers um, of Trent. But uh, now he was teaching a lot of errors on grace. And so he got formally condemned by Pope St. Pius V. And then there's this controversy they call the P and comma because they send the condemnation. There's no punctuation. It's in, uh, you know, <laughs> large letters like a medieval document. So it's read publicly in the university. And then, uh, you know, Bias says, well, if we put a period here, it doesn't exactly condemn me, whereas if we has it here, then it certainly does. And so these kind of debates go up. You know, he's like, who knows if the Pope maybe isn't really the Antichrist, right? And so, uh, so Bellarmine it, it endeavors to correct a lot of this stuff, but without creating controversy or having um, anger fall on the Jesuits directly. So one of the th- yeah, so what he does is principally to, to refute biases, opinions, and teachings, but without naming him at all. And then given the authority, especially St. Augustine as well, because then bias is always trying to base itself solely on Augustine's authority and, um, you know, things of this sort. So in um, so in that seven-year period, Bellarmine preached for six, taught for six, but at different overlapping intervals. And finally, his health starts failing. And, the, and, then, um, and then they're actually getting ready. They think he's going to die. And so Rome actually calls him back. They say, well, let's send him back to Italy and hopefully his native heir will help him recover a little bit. Um, you know, very different cultures. Louvain is obviously it's much colder. It's right on, um, you know, you know being, being somewhat near the English Channel. Um, the, the, the food is, you know, a bit different. They have, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the autobiography calls it pan negro, pan negro or black bread. Um, which I actually have not researched to find out exactly what the black bread was made of, but it wasn't like you're, you're like uh, Tuscan bread at all. The beer is a little bit harsh for him. And so finally his health, you know, breaks and then and, and the order comes in that he's going to be shipped back to Italy. So um, th- that gets, uh, they, they finally decide, okay, we'll let him go. And that's the thing too, whenever he's transferred somewhere, nobody wants to let him go. They said, no, we got to keep him here. He, he's, he's so great. We have to have him. Um, but he gets sent back. And one of the things they do is that the uh, the Eighty Years' War was on at the time. That is, the uh, the Dutch had revolted against the Spanish, uh, the people in the, in the Netherlands mostly. So they had a loose line that was always moving back and forth of uh, you know the Spanish Netherlands and the Dutch Republic, uh, what would eventually be the Dutch Republic. And so that fight was on. And of course, the Dutch Republic, even though it had a lot of Catholics in it, the uh, the commanders were mostly Protestant. And at that time, they were killing a lot of Catholics. And uh, the, the word got out, uh, you know, that uh, at one point that they were beyond their way to Leuven. So Bellarmine actually himself was scattered with a number of his brethren and um, was saved by a coach driver who drives up and declares, I hear two, three masses a day just because I know it ticks off the heretics, <laughs> namely the Protestants. And, uh, and then they take off. Um, and he and saved a lot of people that supposedly from Protestant armies, but they get driven off by the Duke of Alva. So that um, anyway, so that's threatening again. So Bellarmine gets in a party and knows that you always travel in parties. You rarely ever traveled alone, at least not any long distance, because if you did, you're going to be set upon by robbers and often killed, especially in these parts uh, where there's a lot of Protestants who'd be more than happy to, to kill a Jesuit. So. Bellarmine gets dressed up like a little colonel. They stick some pistols in his belt. And, um, and, and again, now we get to, there's even Protestants in this group of people he's traveling with, but they get along famously. So he would just declare he'd, he'd ride ahead and reconnoiter the ground a little bit. And then he would just stop when he was all alone to pray his breviary and then, and then rejoin the group and uh, got along famously with all of them. So finally they make their way into Italy and they ended, he uh, gives them their farewells. And then uh, the next day they go to mass and they look and they're like, that's the colonel saying mass because it was Bellarmine now, now vested properly, um, you know, which uh, kind of, kind of comical actually to think of him with some pistols in his belt, just uh, going about. But <laughs> so anyway, so this, he's back in Rome. And then one of the reasons they want him back in Rome is uh, one, one of his other bit of leisure activities while he was in Leuven is that he was reading all the books of the Protestants. And again, because he had that photographic memory, 
he manages to memorize what they had what they'd actually said. Because now the one big problem for people who were trying to invade against Luther or Calvin is oftentimes they could not get their hands on the books that they had written because of censorship laws. And it was it was um you had to get all these special permissions. It was difficult. And then it's a long bit of reading. And a lot of times guys would, re- would not really perceive what, they, what the reformers are talking about, so-called reformers. Uh, Bellarmine did. And, and not only did that, but he also had mastered the fathers. And this becomes apparent in what happens ne- next when he's sent to Rome. Yeah, I'm starting to think of sometimes Neo with the Matrix. He's just plug it back in the back of his head. I know Kung Fu. I know Greek. <laughs> I know the fathers. <laughs> Darn, I wish it worked that way. It'd make life so much easier. But uh, anyway, so one of the things that they want to set up in, in, in Rome is a chair of controversial theology. Controversial theology is the, uh, the forerunner to apologetics, essentially, as we know it today. And other really distinguished uh, theologians had tried to set it up, and they'd all failed. So now it's, well, we got to get... Um, you know, Bellarmine in here. Let's bring him in since I know we know he's been studying these things. So they have him set it up and he would just walk and walk in and set up the, his class, uh, you know, topically. So here's, you know, a discussion on, you know, uh, scripture, on the Pope, on the Eucharist, on whatever the, the topic was. And so this is what the Protestants taught in the subject, an accurate knowledge of what the Protestants had taught. Then he would say, you know, but this is what scripture teaches and the fathers. He also knew the Bible by heart. And he had the, the entire thing he memorized it, although the, the version he memorized had just had chapter divisions and no verses. They hadn't put those in yet <laughs> in the Bible he used. So, but whenever it was one of the things that comes across in all of Bellarmine's writing, both his uh, theological controversies and also his aesthetical writing, is that his uses of scripture feel very natural. They feel like they, um, they are verses he knows, and it, and it occurred to him while he was arguing the point to, to make use of this verse and to, and to give uh, commentary on it because it's because he knows it so well. It's not something he wrote, okay, now it's time to start proof texting, time to go grab some Bible verses to, to, to make it more appealing. He's a man that first and foremost knows the scriptures and um, had them, you know, completely memorized. And so this course becomes a success. Cardinals are coming in to sit on it. And so finally someone tells the Pope, this stuff's got to get written down. So the new superior general, Claudio Acquaviva, uh, the Pope commands him to have Bellarmine write all of this stuff down. And so that becomes the controversies. Um, the, the full title is Disputations on the Controversies of the Christian Faith Against the Heretics of This Time. And that's that's the, um, the, the full title. So originally it was done in three volumes in print. Uh, later, they, they break it up a little bit to make it four. And so the, that um, so, so four volumes is how you properly reference it. The... You have uh, the first treatise is on the word of God, naturally. Uh, that's the whole, you know, one of the big things, the arguments of the Protestants is sola scriptura and, <clears throat> and whatnot. So then they proceeds from there toward the end in over two million words on top, you know, covering all the, we want we can talk about it a little more later, um, but he talks about obviously Christology, the papacy, the church, ecclesiology. He lays down all the principles of ecclesiology for the next few hundred years. The, um, the sacraments and the economy of salvation, which is, um, you know, grace, original sin, justification, and uh, the value of good works, right? This rounds it all out. And so the uh, so immediately these have, you know, an electrifying effect when once they're published. He had big book fairs, and that's where people go because you didn't have catalogs yet, in, in, in the, let alone Amazon. So you uh, went to a book fair to, to pick up books, and, and so basically he sold out of, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of copies that just sold out. And the uh, and a lot of the people who were buying them were Protestants because they wanted to say, Let, let's see what the latest papistical arguments are that we have to, to contend with. And just by doing that brings a lot of conversions. Actually, one prominent conversion took place in um, Dr. Anthony Carrier, who is the chaplain for King James I. Uh, and the, the, the controversies are published in 1588. So this event takes place more like 1606, I think. But um, and so, but it had a, tra- a tradition for the Anglicans where they would buy up Bellarmine and they they would read his theological arguments and they'd write replies. Um, you know, the most one of the most foremost was William Whitaker, who was um, 
uh, I'm trying to remember his exact position. I believe he was an English divine and had some connection to the government that I can't, I can't remember at the moment off the top of my head. Bellarmine was really impressed by Whitaker and actually considered him the most learned heretic he'd ever read. <laughs> so the, um, but nevertheless, so the, the, the English divines would, would be able to have these things in Latin themselves. But if uh, average people had them, whether in Latin or in English, they'd be put to death because it was illegal in England to possess a copy of Bellarmine or other Catholic books too, oh, yeah. for that matter. Right. The, um, so, you know, and there, there's conversions all over the place that, that are occurring from all this. So he also gets a little bit of criticism. There's one Jesuit that uh, says that they, they, well, there's no no point to reading the heretics. They're all quoted in Bellarmine, <laughs> right, which isn't exactly true. And uh, uh, it actually kind of unner unnerved Bellarmine a little bit. One, because of the guy's writing, he actually mixes up the genders of various Latin nouns and, and adjectives, showing that he's just not expert enough to even be making the criticism, <laughs> right? But then the next thing was that he said, well, if I had just quoted Luther and Calvin and left it, well, obviously that'd be a problem. But I wrote it and he says, don't forget St. John Fisher quoted whole books of Luther when answering Luther. So it's not as if this is you know, going to harm the faith by having the replies in, in there, too. But um, that was a very minor criticism. In general, it was all praise for this thing. And then it kept going through several editions and you keep correcting them. And, uh, cause there's always printer's errors and things of that sort. So, um, yeah. And that, uh, so that kind of made him a household name. And they weren't dry. They, they're, you, it's, you can see, read his humor. He kind of gives mm -hmm. a little jest throughout the whole thing. Right. Yeah, he does. Uh, there's this one, one, actually one of the hilarious line is the, um, there, are these, there was this group of uh, people called the Centuriators of Magdeburg, and they were or Magdeburg. I still don't know how to properly say the name of this place, <laughs> Magdeburg. But anyway, uh, at, East, at the time, that was uh, Eastern Germany, and they they were Lutheran, and they they were um, basically writers headed up by a man named Delyricus. His actual name uh, was. Uh, Matthew, some about everyone took you know nom de plume that were from these Latin names, um, and so I can't remember the the guy's name, but he took the name Illyricus, and he has uh, so written a um, you know this long history called the centuries, and in the centuries they go from the first century to the sixteenth, and the whole point of the book was to prove that the early church was Lutheran and not Catholic, and it was one the one thing it had going for it is that it was the, one of the first cons, uh, attempts, anyway, at a, at a history going from ancient times to modern. And it had the all the appearances of being a concise history. It actually wasn't. It's a pretty worthless history by the testimony of a good number of Protestant scholars. So it's not just the Catholic hint, hint, hint on the thing. It really was bad history. But, and this is one of the things that gets Cardinal Baronius, for example, to write his annales, which is largely in refutation of it, using actual documentation. And it really... Baronius creates the very systematic historiography that we use today, honestly. Um, whereas the centuriators, it was a lot of arguments, sometimes a lot of stupid things. Uh, they would, you know, condemn uh, the, 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 the papistical inventions of conf uh, confirmation and thing, things like that. That is the sacrament of confirmation. And then they would see, well, Tertullian taught confirmation rather explicitly, this anointing distinct from baptism. And then they say, well, these are just blemishes in the fathers. And so he, you know, Bellarmine, you know, mocks this. And then also the whole thing about the chalice, um, they end up uh, adding a line that they claim is scripture. It's actually not a scriptural line at all. So Bellarmine catches them with that. It, it was probably done accidentally. So he, he just has some humor with it. And he says, well, um, you know, perhaps since the Lutherans are so big and letting the faithful have the chalice, perhaps they imbibed a little too much of the chalice and then with starry <laughs> eyes put in this, this, this verse that's not actually in scripture. <laughs> he, um, he always had jokes like that. But one of the things that he didn't do was, uh, you know, hurl abuse and, uh, you know, right. I mean, in, in the literature of those times, uh, writers were extremely abusive. Uh, to each other. Thomas More is not above it, actually. And in, in a book that's a, an embarrassment of two Thomas More scholars, uh, the Con Con uh, Convicie, he had um, responded to Luther's attack on Henry VIII with all sorts of scurrilous language, with the F word in Latin, with the, uh, the S word in Latin, with uh, uh, all these things that are just, just uh, he showed he could swear as good as Luther, right? And he was trying to give Luther as good as he got. 
Um, well, he wrote under a pen name. It was only revealed later that it was more. Um, and that was the style of debate you had. Even the, the Jesuit priest Thomas Stapleton, who wrote one of the, the lives of Thomas More, he had, um, you know, he, he was not above, you know, hurling abuse and name calling at, at, at opponents as well. It was a big snake pit. You know, all these types of tracts and controversies. People would lie and, and say that their opponent died consumed by worms and all these things that 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 weren't, weren't true at all. Bellarmine has a little of that, but only because he's relating it from other sources. And they, since they're Jesuits, he, he just didn't believe they would tell a bold-faced lie. So he incorporates these things, things into some of his writing. But um, but in general, it's really been Bellarmine's the one who stands apart from it. And it's all the more um, there's something to marvel at is Bellarmine also had a, a terrible temper. Um, when uh, at injustices, when when he knew people were double dealing or things, or, or he he would just lose it. He and he had to stop and let it pass. And you see this also later when he's a cardinal and he's a bishop and thinks his temper's ready to explode, and he has to stop it every single time. Um, and you know, it actually, they describe some of this in the canonization documents. Witnesses too would see how red he would get and how very angry. It, it, then this mild, gentle look would come on his face, and he'd let go of it. For an Italian, especially, it's hard to do. <laughs> so I know I have to. If I get mad, I'm mad about it for five minutes. You know, it's at least. But then after five minutes, I do forget, and I'm just like, "What was I mad about again?" Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I need to get a drink. <laughs> yeah, he's got one. I remember it was in the. Uh... The Pope uh, uh, book on the papacy on the Roman Pontiff. He talks about Luther. Somebody's busting him up saying uh, Luther had miracles. He goes, "You're right. He did have a miracle. When he died, they put his body in an airside tear can in the middle of the winter, and it stunk so bad they couldn't move his body anymore. Thus far, the miracle of Luther. <laughs> that was in uh, on the marks of the church, actually. Oh, it was on marks. Ah. Yeah, he has another one is in his book on the mass when he goes to defend the canon, that is the Roman canon or, or what's in the, the the new rite of mass, Eucharistic Prayer 1. Um, he he uh, says, um, you know, after quoting Luther, just saying some really ridiculous things um, about the canon, uh, calling it blasphemous and, and, and wretched and all these things, then um, Bellarmine narrates, but now he comes together with an all more with, with a more uh, scholarly argument. And then he quotes uh, Luther in his book on the abrogation of, of private mass, and he says, "If somebody would come say the word canon, run as if the devil was coming to you." <laughs> unquote. <laughs> right? <laughs> but just how we'd set up and frame that, you know, with this this very serious comment. And now Luther gets serious <laughs> and have something even more ridiculous. <laughs> of things like that so it always makes great reading it it, it really is approachable um, in terms of its theological language some arguments have been superseded by other ones others are still fresh and, and is exegesis is top notch I've, I've scarcely ever seen exegetical commentary as good as Bellarmine's and the other thing too is a lot of people act like say text criticism which is where where you you, you question the provenance of a given test a text and you you endeavor to try to prove that it really is by the author that it's claimed to be and People act like that's a modern science. We came up with it in the 19th or 20th century. They're doing it in the 16th, actually, and in the 15th. And so Erasmus of Rotterdam, for example, is famous for a lot of text criticism he applies to various uh, authors and whatnot. Bellarmine does it, too. He has a book on uh, ecclesiastical writers, which he started writing when he was in Leuven and finishes about this time. And it's a really dramatic book. It takes for its history, you know, the, the authors of the history of the Old Testament, basically of the entire world of, um, you know, writers from the Old Testament all the way through church fathers. And, and he takes on arguments that other scholars had given for why authors did or didn't write this text and either agrees with them or disagrees with them. And he gives a lot of reasons. And most of his judgments actually have been backed up by modern scholars, most of them. Not all of them. He was one place where modern scholarship, and I think it's correct, actually, uh, what Dionysius the Areopagite. It's not really the Dionysius the Areopagite evangelized by St. Paul. And so that's why they, they talk about pseudo-Dionysius, right? And there's a lot of very solid evidence for it. Bellarmine wasn't convinced. He, he was convinced. He, he wanted to side with the tradition. Um, but I think I do think the modern scholarship has the better of him on that question. Otherwise, in general, he's defending writings and authors, and modern scholarship backs him up, actually. And so it was, um, and he's, he's a man of 
just so many talents in, in terms of uh, like, like we mentioned, he picked up Hebrew again in like about two weeks. He was he was reading Hebrew fluently and uh, writing and disputing on Hebrew. He actually wrote a book, a grammar, and he promised that if he used this grammar um, in and he, he let him teach you for a week. Uh, at the end of the week, you'd be able to read the Old Testament with just the aid of a dictionary. So, and people had taken him up on this and found he was exactly right. So that book uh, became the standard reference book for Catholics and Protestants for like a hundred something years, because there was no grammar of Hebrew, right? You can get a Hebrew grammar. And uh, today, you know, there's, I'm just looking, there's a couple of them, like Ksenius. I've got like a couple of handbooks. I've, I've never ventured to actually do it as I, I was always terrible at Hebrew. So it, it um, but in those days, you didn't have that. You had kind of commentaries, rules for rabbis by Vitabolish. You had Roy Flynn's lecture notes. Nothing that gives you this systematic approach. And it's like all over the place. So Bellarmine systematized something that didn't even exist yet. Huh. And it became the standard book for 200 years. <laughs> he got bored, had nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And he always had something else to do. During uh, one of the, uh, the, the rounds where they were trying to canonize him, one of the postulators made a table of uh, when, according to all the notes of the Jesuit uh, infirmarians, when he was sick and how much he accomplished when he was sick. Huh. That's a sign of, and it's, it's really an impressive bit of accomplishment. Whereas today we get a headache, like I get a headache, I, and I, you know, it's like ocular migraines and stuff. I can't do it. I cannot, tra you know, translate stuff. I can't um, get a lot of writing done, right? When they, I get those nasty headaches, they just, I, he did. <laughs> he persevered through. It just shows what wimps we are. But um, anyway, so he gets the success. He gets very famous. And then you have a, a number of other things that happen in his life, right? He gets sent to France as part of a delegation by Pope Sixtus V um, because of the civil war in France and uh, the danger that a Protestant, Henri Bourbon, might become king. And so he, Bellarmine doesn't actually play a part. It's just more miraculous that he's present in the city during like the siege of Paris and things like that. And he suffered around, gave what, what money and you know, he had as alms and, you know, to people and whatnot. Um, he you know, is, is back in Italy. He actually gets uh, put on the index of forbidden books temporarily. Huh. And uh, because uh, so Pope Sixtus V, uh, Papa Terribile is how, how he was ref uh, referred to. He had a horrible, horrible temper, and he made no effort to restrain it. He was a Franciscan, and he had um, – yeah, there's a number of things with Sixtus V, actually, that come up. But he had he was a canonist, and a lot of his canonist friends were really mad because of the fact that Bellarmine took the view that the Pope only had an indirect sovereignty over the world and not a direct one. And this, they felt – contradicted the medieval view, uh, what actually Bellarmine endeavors to show is not the medieval view, uh, but that the Pope himself is the Lord of the whole world and the Pope is merely his vicar. Kings are not really true kings, they're just, um, as I said, right. the Pope is the Lord of the whole world and the kings and their governors, they're all just vic his vicars, they all do his will. And that's the direct sovereignty. Bellarmine argues for an indirect sovereignty, which is that the Pope has no jurisdiction except where he has it by right, say like in the papal states. And this is in book five of his book on the papacy on the Roman pontiff, chapter two. And then, um, but for the sake of the faith, he could interfere. Say, if you had a heretic as a monarch, you could, you know, could, um, you know, excommunicate and release people from their obligations to him, etc. But otherwise, if it wasn't for the sake of faith and morals, that the, the Pope could not intervene in the the political order. And this, uh, so this really ticked off Sixtus V, and he starts this whole thing while Bellarmine's away in France, um, you know, toward a condemnation of various people, even the Office of the Inquisition is like, we tried to tell the Pope that uh, this is not a new opinion. And we also were thought about telling him which saints were, um, you know, had argued for this, but we decided not to, lest the Pope would put the saints themselves on the index of forbidden books. Right? <laughs> he, just, he just wasn't willing to hear it, so and he, he did manage to put it on there. Um, in the 15, what was the year? The 1586 edition of the Index of Forbidden Books, which uh, listed, was it 86 or was it a little bit later? I keep thinking it was a little bit later uh, when all this was going. Maybe it was 1591. Um, I have to double check the dates on, on that in Sixtus the Fifth. But anyway, so it's it was on page because I've seen it. I just don't remember the, off the top of my head which page it was on. It's like page 17, all odd numbered, uh, no evens. And it said, um, you know, 
um, you know, the following Robert Bellarmine and Francisco Suarez, uh, not Francisco Suarez, sorry, uh, Francisco Victoria, founder of the School of Salamanca, were both put on the Index of Forbidden Books until they will amend this position in this section, you know, the whole controversies, right? So now Bellarmine's in the cell with the same forbidden books with Luther and Calvin and all these groups. So finally, the uh, you know about a month and a half later, Pope Sixth uh, V dies, succeeded by Urban the Seventh, who very quickly removes the whole thing. But it basically is like let's pretend this never happened. You know? <laughs> and and by that time, Bellarmine had uh, made it. Actually, by the time Bellarmine gets back, Urban the Seventh had died, and now we were at um, a different Pope. I can't remember then the one after that's Clement the Eighth. The but anyway, so he gets back into Rome after this this mess had gone over, and there's a new mess to deal with, the uh, the new Vulgate, and now the Vulgate. Uh, Trent had declared the Vulgate should be reformed, according to ancient manuscripts. Bellarmine had actually worked on a commission to do this very thing, and they had a lot of notes. They'd gone over so many variant types of manuscripts. Again, the text criticism thing, right? Um, again, a Fulagati, another one of Bellarmine's early. Uh, um, biographer, as he wrote a, a biography in Italian on Bellarmine, he says that one time St. Robert had uh, was going to make suggest changes based on various manuscripts, and he saw an angel with a flaming sword standing at the door that would not allow him to go into the meeting. Now, I don't know what this is based on, but this is a tradition that was passed down, so he decided to rip up his changes, and he, went, he just went home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because there's the sacredness that he, he recognized this, uh, if this story is true, you know, the divine intervention rather than what he thought was so great in going through all these manuscripts to be to, to be a reading of the, you know, the scripture in the Vulgate. And which it actually say something about how the Vulgate functioned in the church until comparatively recently. I don't need to tell you when the um, the Latin Vulgate was the church's official Bible for the for the Latin church. And that meant in all theological debate, that was the edition you had to use. And on top of that, uh, there, there was a methodology of the use of the Vulgate. The Vulgate was kind of like your gold pan. And so if you put in something like the Hebrew or the Greek or this or that manuscript or whatever, and the Vulgate was like the pan that filters out. So the gold is left and everything it wasn't is gone. And, and that's kind of the, the idea behind that. And a lot of people mock that. Well, those aren't the original languages, right? Well, there's manuscript issues where you're not absolutely certain on the, the propriety of the manuscripts that survive in the original languages all, either, especially when you get into questions about Hebrew and, and Masoretic texts and uh, phony Septuagints that were passed around according to some church fathers, like Origen, for example, claims that the Jews were passing around phony text of uh, the, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. So all of these things come to bear. And so that, that's the way the Vulgate was used. And like I said, I don't need to tell you when that changed or why, but, um, you know, read between the lines. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so this was an important deal because this is the church's official Bible and they have to make sure that every change they make in the Vulgate is based on, you know, a reasonable and serious, you know, criterion in, in the manuscript tradition, variant readings and how they accord to the Greek and the Hebrew. Right. So they do all this work and sixth to the fifth comes in and he's looking at all this stuff. He just throws it out and he just starts all over to do it himself. And he has a secretary, nearly kills the secretary. Has a guy almost has a heart attack. He six just orders him to write uh, by hand the entire Bible out, to copy the entire Bible out from the, uh, the Louvain edition. Uh, no doubt he, he missed some stuff doing this work really quickly, right? And then on top of that, so Sixtus starts working with that, and he's looking through manuscripts, and and so he decides he's going to do the whole work himself. Well, what happens is there's verses that he starts missing, there's verses that he he uh, um, you know gets the like the worst possible reading you could get, uh, and things of this sort. So when it's all done. You know, the ambassadors want it so they can review it. And then his secretary's running after him. Wait, he's got more changes. Take it back. Bring it. Give it back. <laughs> then they change it again. Bring it back. And so this this just becomes a big mess with the uh, the the sixth is the fifth Vulgate. So finally, he's got the the, the bull of promulgation is, is ready to be issued. Um, but the Bible, you know, it's like he's waiting for it and waiting for it. Then he goes back and changes some more things. And then it's ready to, to go out and he dies. So the fifth just suddenly dies. And, and actually, this is another bit of uh, prophecies back in France. 
a letter had arrived for uh, the cardinal leading the, uh, the the delegation over over to the French, and uh, they were all scared, and they knew that he, he didn't like because uh, he was a Spanish cardinal. He knew Sixth V didn't like him, and so uh, Cardinal Cajet, not the same Cardinal Cajet and Devio that you see in the 16th century, the same name but different guy. Um, he, he's scared that he's going to be excommunicated or have incurred the Pope's disfavor, or whatever it's going to be, and um, and Bellarmine just says. It's a letter the Pope is dead, and he walks away. Nobody had read it yet. He had no way to know. But again, that prophecy thing, it just floated into his head that, uh, oh, don't worry about it. It just says the Pope's dead. <laughs> it just goes out. Um, so anyway, 6th to the 5th is dead, and now everything's in disarray. So then the Pope's like, what are we going to do about this Vulgate? And everyone's like, this is a train wreck. And, of course, some copies had gotten out. So the Vatican's trying to buy all the copies back. Some had gotten out. And so it's exactly what happened. The Protestants come and start saying, the church changed the Bible. Look, the church tried to change the Bible. So finally, under Pope Clement VIII, uh, you get a pope that lasts for a little bit. um, And he says, what are we going to do about this? And Bellarmine gets up and he says, well, what we should do is... Say that because of some some errors of the printers, which most certainly were in there, um, we have to recall it in order to to revise the work to make it perfect, and then we'll we'll simply you know put it out as the sixth to the fifth Vulgate, and uh, even though, but then we will save the situation by by restoring the propriety of, of the Vulgate and, and fixing things and and so on and so forth. So. That's what happens ultimately. It's one of uh, Bellarmine's biographer, uh, James Broderick. He said in his English biography, he says that uh, it, it's sort of like what Saint Ambrose says uh, um, about uh, you know Jacob or about Abraham. It was more of a, of a marvel than it was a lie, <laughs> but because uh, it does involve a little bit of um, mental reservation in, involved in there in that explanation. But Bellarmine, he wouldn't have done that if he didn't believe it was absolutely necessary because he believed that was the closest the church ever came to actually caring in an official capacity. And by, by, you know, putting out this Vulgate that would have been disastrous. And, it, and it's rather telling. A lot of historians have looked at the fact that Sixth to the Fifth dies before he can put this train wreck of a Vulgate out, which had, you know, so many new. I mean, it didn't have too many really errors in faith and morals, but it had errors in terms of like missing text, incorrect text, um, you know, all sorts of renderings that, that made it unintelligible, other things like all, all over the place. So, they eventually get it done and it gets put out as the Sixto Clementine Vulgate and it gets revised again a little bit later. So it is the Clementine Vulgate and that's basically in use for us since until Vatican II. And it uh, there's there's certain issues there where there, there's the manuscript issues which were known about and uh, the commission that Bellarmine had been on before 6th to 5th actually tried to address. Like this one line, I believe it's Acts 19, where it says that these, you know, the, um, the Jews are telling the Romans, this man has set the, uh, the entire world in disorder. Uh, but then you go to the Greek and it says Poland. He set the entire city in disorder. Um, and so in Latin, that's you have Orbem, the world, and Urbem, the city. Actually, Urpem properly, because that B is more like a P in classical Latin. But um, so some miserable copyist made it, made the turn that U into an O, and thus you had Orbem instead of Urpem, right? And so now, you know, so then, then that reading is in there, and that's, that's why the Dewey Reams has. He set the whole world in disorder in Acts chapter 19, I think it was at 26, I forget. Anyway, so that, that stays and remains in there until, you know, until the end, right? Um, until you know, where we're at now, even though it's complete, it's obvious from the Greek what happened, but we just can't need They just decided so many things to punt on, on, on fixing. Let's just get this thing out now. Cause it's already like two years overdue and, um, you know, quiet people down. So that's what they do. Um, which Bellarmine wasn't really too happy about, but it's one of those things you have to accept. So now back in Rome as, as a Jesuit, he's made a superior for a time over, uh, d- different parts of central Italy, and uh, for the Jesuits, he uh, then he puts into place exactly what he says earlier in his autobiography that when he, when he sent around alone with all these problems going on, he determined that if he was ever in a position of authority, he would never do that. So he puts in all these regulations. You send them out two by two. Um, he was a superior that loved music and he would regularly sing himself. He would get some madrigals. Like if you ever listen to Monteverdi, for example, Monteverdi and his uh, Claudio Monteverdi in, in the, the Madrigali 
And you listen to these amazing, beautiful harmonies. But a lot of them are love poetry and, and these sorts of things. They're celebrating pagan gods and whatnot. And so Bellarmine's like, yeah, that's got to go. The cute senora this guy is singing about has to go. So they replace it. And he would rewrite it according and make set it to the music again to deal with God and the love of God in, in a holy life and encourage all the seminarians to sing it um, at, at the Roman college where he was in authority. And he had one particular, a special uh, student, St. Aloysius Gonzaga. And so St. Aloysius was, was very young. And St. Robert said of him later after, after he died, um, you know, a plague, I forget the, the exact disease has been identified or not. Um, but, Aloysius, we, you know, had Bellarmine as a spiritual director. So Bellarmine would try to correct him on, uh, you know, being too excessive in his penances. And he said, well, how can I do that when the very one who corrects me doesn't follow his own advice? Because he knew Bellarmine was extremely, um, you know, um, what's the right word? He, he, was, he took on violent penances against himself and fasting and so many other things. So Aloysius, uh, you know, threw himself into things, contracts fever, and he dies. And as he's dying, Bellarmine says to him, uh, tell, his actual name was Luigi, uh, Louis. Uh, Aloysius, one of a family member, wanted it rendered that way, and I forget why. So that's how it goes in the canonization, and we call him that, but he was actually Luigi. And uh, so Bellarmine says, tell me, Luigi, how is it that you can pray to God so perfectly without any distractions? And uh, Luigi, Aloysius, he answers, I don't understand when you're thinking about God how anyone could be distracted. And so later, Bellarmine eulogizes him in a conference that he gave where he says that, you know, that even as a youth, he had moved so far beyond many of us graybeards that he could see, uh, you know, God perfectly and never take his attention off of him, even when he was doing work with the poor and other things. And, and he just extols all the virtues that he had, that God had basically granted him this advanced state that most of us don't get, you know, again, as a sign of his glory and his providence. And um, so Aloysius was to him a spiritual child. And so what he asked for was that when he died, he would be placed um, you know, next to uh, uh, St. Uh, to, to Aloysius. He actually went in, in, because Jesuits were usually buried in, a, in an open grave, in a, in a sack. And he didn't know which body was which. Um, but he actually goes to take special care to have Aloysius's body marked out so it could be found later. Because he, again, he has his foresight. He knows he's going to be, he's already in heaven and he's going to be canonized. Which is what happens. And he actually asked to be buried next to Aloysius. That doesn't happen. Uh, what happens instead is Bellarmine gets interred in the Jesu. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but the one, after his beatification in, in 1923, they make good on that. And his Aloysius is buried under his altar in the Church of San Ignacio, uh, which is just down the road a little bit. And they, they, they put Bellarmine there, too. After his beatification, it took took him three hundred years, but they finally <laughs> finally did get to, to rest next to him. But get around and, to it, yeah. <laughs> so he becomes this, and then he ends up uh, serving the Pope in various capacities, like in the Congregation of Rites, um, looking at the you know the, the provenance and the story of various things in liturgy, and they start changing the liturgy. They start altering areas where the, the, the martyrology of this saint and that saint. Um, or there were the breviary readings or certain things in the Missal reflected traditions that rested on no certain authority or were just absurd. So like you get uh, the Feast of St. Petronilla, for example, who was the reported, uh, repeated daughter of St. Peter. And Bellarmine's like, look at this. The, the, the legend says that uh, the, the proconsul was so inflamed with love for her that, um, you know, he had to have her and when she refused, he had her killed. But she was a 60 year old woman at that point, if the chronology is correct. So that doesn't even make any sense. So that, that all gets ripped away. And then the St. Petronilla is reduced to a simple memorial. You, know? <laughs> you, you have other things that uh, they go through, you know, re removing saints out of the mur martyrology were clearly just repetitions of earlier stories pieced together and put together where there's no certain knowledge or, or reference to, um, and then, you know, so they make a good number of changes to the liturgical books, along with Cardinal Baronius. And this is when um, and he had already he'd knew, known Cardinal Baronius in the past and been on friendly terms. But now they become inseparable friends for the rest of their days. Um, Baronius was like Bellarmine. Baronius had absolutely no pretensions to, to ecclesiastical authority. He was a disciple of St. Philip Neri um, as a member of the oratory. He'd written, written the book um, 
the annales, uh, the the, the uh, annals of the Christian faith, right? Which, in the end, he ne- he didn't finish them all the way. They stopped in the 13th century. But um, you know, a very famous figure in Rome, very important figure. And so Clement VIII makes him a cardinal, very much against his will. And then Baronius has to figure out how to how to deal with that. Bellarmine would discover he's soon in for the same treatment. 1599, the uh, he gets the word. Pope Clement VIII is ordered for him to become a cardinal, and it is like in a bomb went off for him. This was against all the reasons why he he went to the Jesuits. He wasn't being given any choice to refuse. It was to, to be done un, strictly under obedience. And he, so he counsels with, um, you know, Claudio Aquaviva, the, the, the Jesuit superior. He counsels with as many people as he can, and they all advise him that, well, there's, there's nothing you can do. You have to submit to the Pope's mercy and ask him to release you. And so then the consistory comes and they they, they go to load, uh, the Pope's going to, to give everyone their red hats. And Bellarmine falls to his knees, begging the Pope um, to, to, to not do this to him and to release him. And the Pope and Clement VIII says that you will accept this under the penalty of my grave displeasure and other things, <laughs> i.e. excommunication and whatnot. So he has to, you know, Bellarmine has to accept it. And very much against his will, because again, you know, obedience, the obedience that defines the Jesuit, promptissima and obedienza, that, that absolute promptness and immediate, to, uh, an immediate obedience to, to what you're commanded. Could have been worse. Could have had, uh, you know, uh, what's his face, the giant, go rip his arms off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. He gets, so he gets, uh, now he's in this palace and he's got to hire servants and things, and he's terrified. He writes letters at this time. Uh, and which are some of these are in his uh, published correspondence. Some of these are, are found in um, Octor- uh, um, Octorium Bellarminium, uh, which is uh, compiled by a French Jesuit, uh, Javier Marie uh, Bachelet, into a volume. Very hard to find, I might add. Uh, but there's letters in there that, that are preserved where he writes in Italian uh, mostly. To, to people, he writes to Cardinal Baronius, how did you do it? How are you doing it and keeping sane? He is deadly scared in these letters that he will be damned, that he will lose his soul on account of being a cardinal. And, and that's one of these most striking things. Oh, I guess I'll be with it. I guess so. I'll just accommodate to this nice new life, right? No, he is terrified he's going to be damned because now he has to have property and possessions. And, um, and he's afraid if he has too many of them, um, this will be a huge problem for him. Mm-hmm. So, and the, but and the the demands of, the, of papal ceremonial, for example, if he had to wait on the Pope, he had to have so many servants to to X number of servants do it. He couldn't get them all in one carriage, so he has to have two. And this vexes him. He's like, can I have two carriages? Is two carriages too much? Am I going <laughs> to be damned? And and eventually, various writers put him at ease, and so he he kind of so he starts looking for ways he can continue to live his life. He absolutely hated his life as a cardinal. Uh, without question. This is not anything he wanted to live. It's not the way he wanted to be. So he goes and starts looking for various ways to help the poor. And the Pope's looking for ways to enrich him, and and, and he, he won't take him. And he just looks at what he's got, make sure he can pay the, his household, uh, the servants that he has to have in order to, to wait on the Pope and whatnot. And then he just works, uh, you know, giving away everything he can to the poor. His uh, cardinal's ring. Uh, one time, um, a certain man named... Um, uh, his name. Um, anyway, the, the his master of house, Guidotti, that was his name. Um, Monsignor Guidotti, Peter Guidotti, the his master of house. Um, you know, he, he was a very worthy man, tried to keep the, the finances, but it was he was driving him nuts. He's ripping his hair out trying to keep the finances because Bellarmine's giving everything away <laughs> faster than he can, you know, get any square any money away. And Bellarmine knew he always had some money hidden away. So he would do things like he would threaten. Um, oh, why don't you go get the silver ewer that um, Cardinal Aldo Brandini gave to us? So Cardinal Aldo Brandini is the nephew of the Pope, and this would be taken as a great offense if this was sold and if he went to visit Bellarmine and it wasn't there, right? So uh, Guidotti would go, instead of doing that, find whatever money he'd squirreled away to give to some poor beggar that's go begging the Cardinal. Again, it would be found with no money. And he'd say, all right, take my Cardinal's ring and take it to a certain pawnbroker on the Via della Scrofa. And uh, and they all give you what you need. And then Bellarmine would go visit the pawnbroker and buy it back a little bit later. You know? And then this is going. And it's in the canonization docs too that the, the pawnbroker himself said that that ring went through his shop countless times. <laughs> he couldn't count it. 
Um, yeah, because he has he's got to get it back because it would also be a huge scandal if he did that. Yeah. Right. So so then a big controversy breaks out, which um, on efficacious grays, we've been a long time, so I don't want to get into that because it's just too complicated. But, um, uh, I'll tell you about how you can find out more about that in a little bit. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, so so this controversy breaks out between the, the Jesuits and the Dominicans. Bellarmine doesn't agree with either of them, e- even his own Jesuit brothers. He thinks that Molina, for example, the author of the, the opinion in question, was wrong on various points, just as he thinks the Dominican Banyas is wrong on various points. So, but he's trying to, you know, but he realizes the Pope wants to condemn the, the position that had been popular with the Jesuits and, and uphold the Dominican one. And he thinks it's mistaken. And he's afraid too. This is going to again be like Sixth the Fifth, you're right, you know, because he's like, this is such an obscure and difficult manner, matter. How is it that we can formally define this question? It's so obscure that a mistake could be made. So he's really terrified about that. And then, um, final, but he, so he, and he's a gentle critic of Clement VIII, but a critic, critic nonetheless. And Clement VIII basically made up his mind. Whatever the findings of these various commissions, he knew he was going to define it on a certain side. So he sends Bellarmine away, makes him a bishop. And Bellarmine's like, woohoo, gone. He, he, within 28 days, he was out of the city. And, and it, it, this kind of shocked Clement VIII. It was only at that point that he realized how much St. Robert hated being a cardinal. Because most of the time, you can make a guy a bishop, it would still take you years to get him out of the city. And um, he's gone. <laughs> and <laughs> just like that. So that ended his input into this whole discussion. And in the end, uh, it, it, would, it would take until Paul V, actually. Um, and then Bellarmine would be a little bit instrumental in that, too. But peace is restored, and the church says that each side can debate the question. No one may call the other one a heretic, etc. And so that, that's the way it sits, even to this day. But anyway, so Bellarmine takes up in Capua. Capua is an ancient city from Roman times, although the medieval city is built on the ruins of the old one, uh, destroyed by an earthquake, I'm pretty sure. And, and he lived an exemplary life as a bishop. He's only a bishop for about three, three or four years, but he was an incredible bishop. Um, he gets down there, and the first thing is they want to uh, – you know, take from the take money from the clergy in order to offer him a gift. And he says, absolutely not. You're not going to do that, especially poor clergy. I don't want you taking money from them. Just give me a gift. I don't need anything. But they insist and it's customary. And he says, all right, but only as long as it's voluntary. No priest who can't afford it is, is pushed to do it. Right. Um, and, and then he goes and sells a gift and gives it to the poor. <laughs> he uh, would go inquire. And, and of course, as, as a, a, uh, cardinal and also as a bishop, he was not under any obligation to keep the Jesuit rule to say the office uh, silently. But he did it anyway. Always kept the Jesuit rule as as much as he could in these other jobs. So he would get up and say matins um, in the, the tradition in the traditional breviary, which is very long, um, actually far longer than it is in the sixty two. I might add at this time, this is uh, sixteen hundred. Then. He uh, would get into the, the the choir in the cathedral and sing matins with the canons there. And then once you sang the public offices, you were entitled to a stipend. So he got up every single morning and did this so he could get that choir stipend. The choir stipends he would save up and he would use it to purchase, uh, you know, food for poor people and even poor nobility. And so poor nobility have a problem that by their state, it would be a, sh- a shameful thing for them to beg. And a lot, a lot of them, it's a hard thing for them to beg or let them anyone know they're in help. So he would discreetly find out who needed help, even amongst this poor nobility, and funnel them things, you know, for their help and their subsistence. Um, one thing he noticed is the appalling uh, catechesis, because the last bishop had, had never resided in the diocese. So there, there's just uh, people that don't know their faith anywhere. So he has, um, he, he sends out, uh, he gets some Jesuits and others and diocesan priests, sends them on a mission to go preach to the faithful. And he makes sure all their bills are paid. That way they would ask nothing of the people. And because this is a problem, the, the Vagus priest, that is the, the foil of Chaucer and so many, they would go in, do some hocus pocus uh, pig Latin over some bread and then say, look, see, I just did a mass and uh, pay me. <laughs> that, that's what used Show to happen. Show me the money. Yeah. <laughs> so this is something, and people still have acute memories of this type of thing. So Bellarmine made sure all these priests are paid. And so they would go in and preach to the people. And once they saw that they asked absolutely nothing of them, they were willing to come listen, make their confessions, learn their catechism. He would go and teach boys catechism himself personally. Um, 
you, you know, you would not, um, not just hand it off to other people. He personally did it. And he started, it was generally the custom that you would only preach during Advent in uh, Lent. Well, Bellarmine starts preaching every Sunday and every Holy Day in his cathedral. Oh. And again, people start flocking around because they're the bishop is preaching. It's like an unheard thing. I mean, it's in, you have exceptions like St. John Fisher, St. Charles Borromeo. Most bishops never preach, actually. And they hand that off to others. So here's their bishop preaching. And there's just a holiness that radiates off him. All the people, again, they want to be near him all the time. Uh, he finds out about, you know, widows in need and orphans in need. A man um, is dying and won't make his confession because he's so concerned what's going to happen for his daughters and his, and his wife. And so Bellarmine hears that he won't make his confession and immediately stops everything he's doing. And he spends the time to, to walk all the way across the city in order to, no buses back then, in order to go into the house of uh, this guy who's dying. And then and he won't confess. And so Bellarmine just takes his hand and he assures him that as is his word, as the bishop of the diocese, he would make absolutely certain that uh, all that his, his widow would be provided for and all his daughters would be, that he'd find good marriages and take care of them as if they were his own daughters. And the man is so moved by this that he's able to make his confession right to Bellarmine and then he dies. He get after he gets last rites and he's and he, and he dies and so in Bellarmine was as good as his word. He found um, you know marriages for them. One of those girls actually testified at the first canonization proceedings. That's in the in uh, sixteen twenty three when they're collecting documents. So uh, so that's there. Um, you know all these incredible things he did as a bishop, and then Clement the uh, Clement the eighth you know writes him and and says you know we want you to tell us what kind of a job we're doing. And so Bellarmine writes his memorial to Clement VIII, where he says clearly, um, if the Pope should, I, he says, I pity no man on earth more than I pity the Supreme Pontiff. If the Pope should uh, see to it that good men are appointed as bishops, and those bishops in turn appoint good priests, then, then the souls, that the blood of the souls of the faithful will be, will, um, you know, he'll satisfy his obligations there. But if he appoints bad bishops, who in turn appoint bad priests, who cause souls to be lost, the blood of those souls will be required at the Pope's hand. Hmm. And so today he'd be called a schismatic for, for daring to write to the Pope in such a way. But uh, you know, something of that sort. But uh, nevertheless, and that's uh, Clement VIII, you know, takes it, but then he tries to respond, well, you know, we can't be perfect. And then we admit we've sinned, but I mean, even Christ chose Judas, which is a total non-argument. Right, <laughs> Christ knew exactly this is needed to fulfill prophecy. It's not as if you know. It's like if you're just lackadaisical in your choice of bishops, <laughs> that's what Bellarmine's saying. It's not going to be. Yeah, well, I'm just going to pick that. Hey, Jimbo, come over yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then uh, Clement the Eighth dies, and then there's a conclave. So Bellarmine has to go for the conclave. And he's the leading guy. Some people are Baronius, but really Bellarmine's the leading candidate. So as soon as Bellarmine hears this. He won't be nice to anyone. He won't uh, talk to anyone. He just could just praying the rosary all the time and spends a lot of time in his cell because they make these makeshift cells that you have to live in while you're in the conclave, uh, which are rather miserable. So to, in order to hasten you to make a decision, so you're not going to linger on it too long. And what, what Bellerman ends up doing is he tells us in his autobiography, I just prayed one prayer the entire time. Libera me a papatu, deliver me from the papacy. <laughs> Right. And so then uh, Cardinal Baronius comes in and tells him, hey, what are you doing? All you would have to do is is just to smile and nod and and, and, and with uh, this is Cardinal and that Cardinal and you would be Pope. And Bellarmine looks down at the floor and there's a piece of straw on the floor. And he says, if picking up that straw would uh, make me Pope, it would stay where it lay. <laughs> And, and for obvious reasons, if, if he writes that memorial, yes. the, all this stuff rests on, on uh, you know, the Pope's hands. He doesn't want anything to do with it. I mean, if he didn't want to be a cardinal, good grief, he doesn't want to be a Pope. <laughs> so they, um, you know, they, they elect a guy and he dies in like 15 days. And so he's got to go back and do the conclave again. And they elect Paul V. So, uh, so Paul V, uh, Camillo Borghese, um, what he does is that he, he tells Bellarmine, I want you. I need you back here as a cardinal. 
And he says, well, if you want me, you have to provide for my diocese. You must provide a worthy man. So they look and they get a man that um, promises is worthy and he's going to take care of things and uh, sends him down. And the guy ends up on diplomatic missions, never resides in the diocese again. And so that, uh, that example that Bellarmine, you know, set, you're like, well, you know, oh, well, I can't win them all. And it's sad, too, is the legacy of Bellarmine and Kappa was, is, is so tremendous, not just from the things I mentioned, but uh, using money to, to help poor priests. Every priest knew he was a father to them. Any priest that did bad would be terrified because he would come down with thunder and justice. The um, priest that needed uh, furnishings, one of the first things he looked at in any church when he visited the diocese was whether the church was properly furnished and had everything it needed for, for mass. And if anything was lacking at all, he provided for it out of his own funds. That way the priests wouldn't feel put out uh, about it. Um, he would improve their vessels. If their vessels, their vestments, all these things were, were inadequate, he would replace them. Um, he wanted to see the mass was celebrated in the most worthy way. He was checking to make sure there were subdeacons sufficient to, to help make solemn masses set everywhere. And then there's an occasion, there's actually a nice occasion that happens um, at the tail end of his episcopacy where uh, someone writes and says, you know, why is it that your order um, celebrates these missa cantata, the things that were meant for mission territories, where there's only a priest and they sing the mass instead of having the full ceremonies of the, the Roman rite. And, and Bellarmine, you know, hears about this and he's like, what the heck are they doing? So he writes to the superior general saying, you know, people are telling me you're doing this. And then he goes to lay down the law that these, these things are not appropriate for the Roman rite, that especially when there's endless numbers of deacons and subdeacons that you could draw upon to, to say mass, in large churches, uh, the ceremonies of the church should not be omitted for any reason. And so already now he's castigating his fellow Jesuits because they're not saying the mass correctly. Huh. <laughs> that, that would never happen again. <laughs> so uh, all these amazing things. So he ends up uh, back under Paul V, and then he gets dragged into to controversies. Uh, that he doesn't want to be in because he wants to write, but he has to at the Pope's order. The Venetian interdict is a big one. Uh, the last time interdict was used in a whole nation, actually. And so Bellarmine has to write like Paolo Sarpi and in some of these, these uh, characters uh, on political philosophy and other things. And um, then you get uh, the crisis with the war with King James. And uh, we've already gone long, so I'd love to talk about this. I don't know if you want to do another one or um, you're just, just kind of go for a bit. I'm, I'm up. <laughs> okay. Uh, King James I of England, sixth of Scotland, had uh, succeeded Elizabeth. And so one of the things that he did, you have the gunpowder plot, which I will not talk about here. Um, and then you have what follows, the oath of allegiance, that all Catholics must deny the power of the Pope to depose a monarch. Now, whether that was a doctrine or not was, is definitely questionable. Uh, certainly things popes had done, but, and that was one of the things the English absolutely hated is the Pope's power to depose, right? And going back to Elizabeth. Um, so they had to ref uh, uh, declare that the Pope had no such power to depose a sovereign and the Pope had no power of any sort in England and, and this and that and the other thing. Um, so that was a huge, usually problematic thing. Because you have, um, if it was seen as if we deny this, we're denying the whole lot of papal uh, infallibility. We can't do that. But that's what the king is telling us we have to do to be good citizens. So Catholics refused to take the oath. Um, and they had, they had constituted this archpriest named Blackstone. And the idea of an archpriest is there'd be some kind of authority for mission priests working in uh, England. So... Uh, so, so Bellarmine, um, you know, finds out that this priest named Blackstone had been captured and had basically given in and told, uh, tried to tell all the Catholics they should sign this oath of allegiance. Hey, everyone, it's safe and effective. Sign this oath of allegiance and it, it'll be OK. <laughs> and uh, so Bellarmine writes him a letter why this was wrong. And then the king seizes upon that. So he writes a book, uh, De Triplici uh, Noto uh, Valcuneo. Contra, um, contra Papistas, I think, I can't remember if the subtitle is right, but um, in the Latin, but the, the, the threefold knot or wedge against popery. And so he, he uses it to take Bellarmine's letter and see the, the papal agent is interfering in our domestic affairs. And so he writes this book against Bellarmine, attacking Bellarmine, attacking the church, attacking the Pope. So Bellarmine responds uh, with a ghostwriter. 
And actually, then the king didn't write this under his own name, although he couldn't contain himself. So later, he just had to let it out there that he wrote it. Um, the next thing that happens is Bellarmine then is ordered by the Pope to write a response. And so he does it uh, under the pen name of his chaplain. Uh, his name is Torcati. And of course, that translates into in English as twisted. And so the, the, the English make a, a little bit of fun with that. But then uh, so James gets gets ticked off because one of the things that Bellarmine does in there is he reveals certain very uh, uncomfortable correspondence. So while James was the king of Scotland, his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, was in England and, uh, you know, in jail, ready you know, to be executed. So there were various times that the papacy approached James about unseating Elizabeth, and he had put out his feelers to show that he was very much interested in this and was willing to convert to Catholicism and had great things to say in praise of the Pope and praise of uh, the church and whatnot. And so... Um, and then he saw that all the actors weren't coming into place. And so he just went and betrayed the plot to Elizabeth to make it to, to, to make himself see, I'm helping you out here, make sure I'm in the succession. Um, so Bellarmine reveals some of these untidy details and things he had said, and, and, and that causes a lot of trouble for James back in England. So James is outraged, he gets mad. And so he writes a new book now under his own name against Bellarmine directly. And then Bellarmine gives his second apologia against King James, which he has to write, you know, directly and deal, even deal with things like on Antichrist. Again, he dealt with that in the controversies. But he has to rehash it all because James is bringing that in. Becomes this really nasty war in letters and pamphlets. Henry IV of France is telling, trying to tell them both, no, 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 knock it off, stay out of it. We don't, this is not good for anybody. <laughs> James, the whole, Bellarmine basically stopped the entire government of England in its tracks for a year and a half because James would do nothing else but looking for more books to write and more arguments to write against Bellarmine. So eventually then, then it moves on to be continued against uh, so, you know, subordinates and it goes on forever. Um, interestingly enough, it, it, later in James's life, he was reading some of Bellarmine's aesthetical works, which I'll talk about. And he, um, and then somebody comes up with it, some Anglican divine comes up with the latest book that's been written against Bellarmine. He says, oh, whatever. There's more learning in Bellarmine than all the divines in this kingdom put together. <laughs> and so and, and there, there's no evidence that James died as anything but an Anglican or a Protestant. But um, but still, you know, he, he'd come to have a very healthy appreciation for him. Um, Bellarmine, one of the reasons we call him Bellarmine and not Bellarmine, though, like we do for others like Galileo, who we'll get to in a little bit, is that. Um, you know, he'd become this more or less this gargoyle in the ecclesiastical landscape of the English church. And so he had, his name gets anglicized and, and good order. And it shows up in a lot of derogatory references during that period, all the way through the 1600s before it kind of tapers off. And he's largely forgotten in England, except for some reference here and there, um, or you'd read a reference to him in older books. And then, you know, for the most part, you just don't see it again. But that's uh, that's how it comes that tradition, you know, of, of getting rid of his O <laughs> and anglicizing it comes from. So anyway, so James, that was a huge, huge deal. And then, you know, he sends the reclining years of his life. He's doing a lot of work. He worked for the Holy Office of the Inquisition. That is what we now call the CDF. Uh, he wrote a lot, you know, various documents, cases and things like that. Um, he wrote a number of aesthetic, aesthetical works, which he called his little Benjamins. One of them that I'll be publishing soon. I'm actually thinking I'm going to set up the pre-order button tomorrow. Um, is the ascent of the mind to God by the ladder of things created, which is a wonderful book that it takes uh, similar to some writings that you see in Lewis of Granada, uh, it takes the theme of creation and it moves by steps of a ladder unto the final ascent to God. And that's the, um, you know, kind of this deep spiritual consideration of, of then the things in the earth, uh, the way physics and nature work, all the way up to the angels themselves, and then God himself. And he spends about about a third of the book just on considering the qualities of God himself known from philosophy that are more simplified to draw the mind, you know, again, in, towards the meditation of the glory of God. He does another book, uh, De Gemma to Columbi, on the sigh of the dove. And this is a wonderful little book on penance, basically, the necessity of tears. Um, at the same time, that one's never been translated, and, and actually, it's not even on uh, Google Books. I have a copy from 1627. That's another one I'm translating, although I'm nowhere near done, so I'm not opening up a pre-order for that one. If anyone's <laughs> wondering, but not yet. Hopefully, hopefully next month. 
But uh, then there is um, other works that you might be more familiar with, um, his writings on the hell and its torments, on uh, the happiness of heaven. Uh, Tan publishes these. They've, they've been out for a good number of years in translation. The, um, the, the, the Art of Dying Well, Ars uh, Bene Moriandi, that's a really fantastic book, actually. Um, and Protestants sometimes took these books. I, I know for a fact the, the Felicity of the Saints and the Art of Dying Well they took. And they what they and they did this with a number of books too, even sometimes from St. Augustine, actually. They would remove Catholic elements that were they this is too papist, get rid of that, and then leave the elements that they felt were in accord with scripture. And that was called the repurposing of papist books. <laughs> that a number of times for Bellarmine. So you find older copies, you got to watch out of things. Like, and I've looked at that with older books that I was going to republish. Hey, all I have to do is modernize language. I'd be going through, it's like, something's off here. I go look <laughs> at the Latin and I, and I was like, oh, no wonder. This is an Anglican version of the book that cut all the good stuff out. Well, that figures. Um, anyway. Jefferson, you, the crypto Catholic, uh, took that idea. <laughs> We're not going into that because I have an article coming out in Catholic Family News in like a day or two that that pretty much shows that that legend is entirely fiction. But um, beside any of that, um, I, I didn't want to turn this into political philosophy, so I didn't. Want to that I couldn't help myself. I, I had to. Do it. Yeah, watch, watch, uh, especially if you watch Matt Gaspers on the Twitter. I'll be sharing it on Twitter uh, when, when it, whenever he gets it out. As I know he's um, been ill lately, so but once he's recovered, anyway, it'll go out and you know link to that. So you, you, you'll find it on, on Twitter or whatnot. Um, Fedbook, to the extent I even still use Fedbook. So anyway, so he had those works. And so Bellarmine called those his little Benjamins, right? They had these works. And so in his declining years, you know, he, there, there's a lot of fun anecdotes that come around. Like one time he was in the church of Santa Maria in Transpatina, which is that Carmelite church that's just before you get to St. Peter's. And it, um, <clears throat> It had, you know, and it had displays just like today. They always got some kind of exhibit or something like that if you go in there. Well, back then, actually, that was happening too. So they had various exhibits and archaeology and whatnot. And so this one fellow came, you know, came up to attack Bellarmine and tell him how he couldn't stand him, how pretentious he was. And so Bellarmine, you know, so then uh, some people pull him away. And so Bellarmine just kind of smiles and he says, Well, that little fellow won't be able to contain himself if they make me poop. <laughs> <laughs> And we just let things like that roll off. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is there is other occasions too of, of, of fun and amusing things he did. Um, traveling with Cardinal Baronius, uh, they go into the house of this one nobleman, and they all pretend not to be who they are, but he knows exactly who they are. So they have a little fun game with that. Um, and again, he and Baronius got along famously. And so when they had the, uh, I believe it was the the anniversary of um, what would it have been. Uh, some anniversary related to St. Ignatius, or it was right before they were getting ready to beatify him, uh, Ignatius of Loyola. Um, they did a special, uh, you know, ceremony for the Society of Jesus and also invited Baronius, who's the only non-Jesuit to be present. Um, that's how close that, that the two of them were, actually. The um, And then finally, anyway, he gets to his declining years and then come uh, several... Uh, it comes uh, probably one of the biggest things for which he's remembered, uh, but would have been better if he was younger and in, in uh, possession more of more of his powers, but in his youth, but namely as the trial of Galileo. Right. And we should mention a few other things. So you also have Giordano Bruno uh, that Bellarmine was involved with uh, in, in a lesser way. You just happened to be on the Holy office when uh, Bruno's troubles began under Clement the eighth. And um, so Giordano Bruno is credited with being this scientist and being, you know, discovering all these things. It's it's all horse puppy. It's none of it's true. Bruno was the equivalent of a warlock, really. Um, the, he hadn't worn. They always depict him being burned in his D Dominican habit. Even the statue they set up of him, of him the Campo del Fiore. Uh, whenever I go by that, I would I'd, uh, light my pipe a little, you know, get the flames going, just as a reminder of where he's at now. And just uh, to let you know, for modern <laughs> ways, James Lyons yeah. Weiler of all people was had a big Twitter post, uh, you know, uh, giving all kinds of praise to Bruno the other day. Yeah, and it's it's totally unplaced. The the guy was not a scientist. Um, he was the he was a mathematician because he was an astrologer. He cast horoscopes. Now, granted, a lot of other people did. Pope Paul the Third wouldn't meet anybody unless he he had consulted his horoscope, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless. Um, you know, that's one of the, he goes to Elizabeth in England where he trains in John D's circle. If you know anything about John D, you know why that's a bad thing. 
Um, his, his theories on uh, Copernicanism or the multiverse were merely, I mean, that, that he's not condemned for any of that. Um, they were they were merely accidental, and they play into his his uh, major involvement in Egyptian Hermeticism and these other really demonic forces. And eventually, he was so toxic, and basically, he was kicked out of every city in Europe. And he was so toxic that anti papal Venice handed him over to the Pope. So he had, uh, you know, under actually under Bellarmine's influence, he had. Um, sworn off all this stuff and promised to return to the, the practice of the faith. And he was for a little while uh, treated very nicely by the Pope at unlimited pen and paper and so many things. And then uh, he relapsed because right. But as a relapsed heretic, he has to be burned. And, and one wonders if he didn't set this trial up on purpose, uh, pretending to, to be Catholic and go back to this. But so what is he condemned for? He's not condemned for the multiverse or whatever they, they would even understood the concept then. Um, he was not condemned for Copernicanism. Uh, he was condemned for denying the divinity of Christ, the virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary before birth, um, all sorts of blasphemies against the saints, against the church, again, you know, um, denying the power of, of uh, the merits of Christ to save, denying even the, the, uh, the, the, the heaven. There, there's so many ways in which he was denying Catholic doctrine. That's what he was condemned for. Not a word. And the thing is, the guy was not a scientist. Right? Um, it probably would have been better to just let him languish in jail than turn him into a martyr for modern, you know, scientists to pick up on. As oh, look at this, you know, or I should say the atheists, like in the the Italian atheist atheistic um, Masonic state of the 19th century, they they lionized someone like Giordano Bruno and made him this this incredibly important personage. And that's a lot of where the legend comes from. But the reality is he was not a scientist at all. With the, the exact opposite of Galileo, who truly was a scientist. So, but that's uh, so that's one thing. So Bellarmine was only tangentially involved in it as, in as much as, well, the law says he has to be burned. And, well, he, he's a relapsed heretic, so the law needs to take its course. And and that's what, what happened. Uh, the bigger issue was with Galileo comes to town. So Galileo Galilei. He largely has his patronage through the Medici. There's many cardinals that give him patronage as well. Maffeo Barberini, for example, becomes the the uh, the head of the Barberini family, and eventually the Pope Urban VIII after Bellarmine's death. Um, he is, um, you know, is a complicated character. He's an interesting character. He's a mathematician. He's also a bit of a charlatan when he can get away with it. Um, when he, he is a lot of bravado, he's, he's very. Um, very clever, uh, even like, like for example, the famous Pisa experiment where he drops a rock and, and a smaller rock to disprove Aristotle, and then um, and they fall at the same rate. Even then, he has to measure it in decimals. That's just a mathematical flourish. There was no tool that existed at that time that could have measured it in decimals. He made it up, right? I mean, the, the, the experiment was correct, and everything he found and in, in, in proved by it was correct, but he still had to add this little bit just to you know, show much better he is math than everybody. You know, there's a little bit of uh, charlatanry, um, which, which is you know silly. There, there are other things he did. Um, the story about him and the Dutch spyglass is is only partially true. He had somebody else do that for him. He didn't grind it down himself. So all these stories about Gal Galileo grinding down this Venetian, this Dutch spyglass in the the the, the, the Jewish glassmaking quarter there, uh, that's not true. But um, someone else did them. So it, he has a lot of patronage, and then he's making various discoveries in science. And now that he can, he's looking through this telescope, making various things. Copernicus had been uh, published since the 1530s, dedicated to Pope Paul III. So it was entirely permit. Monks had debated the point. John Burdon, for example, is a Flemish monk. He debates whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth. And he favors the, that the sun goes around the earth because that's the tradition, but he entertained entirely possible that maybe this maybe the earth goes around the sun. And that was entirely tolerated in the 15th century when he did that. And so likewise in Copernicus, entirely tolerated as a question, as a scientific question for inquiry. Um, the, so the trouble comes in a bit later. So Galileo, you know, he comes into Rome, already, you know, somewhat of a famous person, is backed up by the Medici also. So he's, um, you know, goes to the Roman college where the Jesuits feast and wine and dine him and sing his praises. This is 1617. 
And then he shows off his um, his writings on the moon. Now, Bellarmine was very good friends with a man named Christopher Clavius. Clavius is one of the main people responsible for the calendar we now use, the Gregorian calendar. It was put out under uh, Gregory the 13th. He's also the, uh, he's got a major, couple major areas on the moon named after him. Uh, you know, major mathematician and scientist. So Bellarmine asks Clavius about things that, that Galileo's, you know, noting about the moon. And Clavius says, no, this is all correct. This is all right. So this just intrigues Bellarmine more. And so he's listening to Galileo and whatnot. And then he, he kind of ignores him um, after that because he's got other things and his health's declining. And then Galileo gets in his first bit of trouble. So he starts putting out on the possibility that the, the earth goes around the sun and the sun is the center of the universe. And this um, has a, you know, has, has a number of Jesuit followers too. Now there is, there is a difference though. So Copernicus's system, by the way, does absolutely nothing really to change Aristotle. It just changes the position of the earth and the sun. So it's still going around in circles and all these things. That's Copernicus's idea. The sun is the center of the universe and everything goes around the sun in perfect circles. And then he still has to use the old things for like Ptolemy's equant and things like that in order to talk about why it seems like Mars is going back. And so oh, the, the more cycles, more circles, which is the, what the Greeks did, more circles. Um, now it was Tycho Brahe, actually. Uh, I know I'm not saying his name right, sorry. He was Danish astronomer, but he was the astronomer for Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor. And he had done calculation after calculation. So he came up with a different system. The Earth is in the center, but the sun moves around the Earth and all the planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits. And with that, he was able to explain every single anomaly, every single question, as well as every single force then known. And that model still holds up very well today, by the way, if you're going to use it to explain phenomena, it does work. Um, whether you want to subscribe to it or not, we're not going into here. So then his student, Kepler, has a, it wants to hold the Copernican view that the, the, the sun is in the center and the earth goes around the sun. And so he has Tycho Brahe's calculations, but Kepler is not a mere plagiarist. And he's not, you know, an incompetent uh, fool. He's got Brahe's calculations, but he has to do them all again. He has to do the work himself. He can't just use what Brahe's got in order to rework it. He has to do the work himself in order to calculate how to, how to chart the, uh, the, you know, the sun and the earth and all the planets going around it in elliptical orbits. So, so he does that and he publishes his findings. And Galileo is supremely interested in his findings. Then Galileo plagiarizes the entire system, claims he did it himself. <laughs> And this gets to some content. Now, this is where he starts getting into debates and discussions, especially with the Jesuits, because a lot of them adhere to Tycho Brahe, right, in his system. Um, and then you've got the, the, the major things that he starts to buttress his arguments by using scripture. Hmm. Hmm. And now we come to the first condemnation of Galileo. I mean, there's, there's so much more to say in the story, but it's, it's uh, time. But when we, when we do a certain series that we're producing, uh, we'll, we'll be covered in full. But Galileo starts using scripture to teach uh, the Earth's the, this, the Earth's movement um, against that of the sun, and reinterpreting the way various verses that had always been done. You know, now is the problem because this is the provenance of theology, not of science. And if Galileo is going to do that, he has to be licensed in theology and have approval for his his work. And so, the the first trial of Galileo is one of authority, not of um, you know, and not not science as such, and so he's he's you know he's brought in, and they have these things, and he says, "Oh, look at these moons around Jupiter. How do you explain them?" And Bell and, and Galileo gives various arguments, and actually, in the various cardinals, it works. That well, all of these things could be explained. He's talking about the tides and things like that. And every physicist, for example, now everyone who gets a degree, a, a doctorate in physics, they all know that the arguments Galileo brought to the Inquisition were false. He couldn't prove what he was saying he thought he could prove. And so his use of scripture was condemned in the first trial. Solemnly condemned that the scripture teaches that the earth, um, you know, that the earth moves. There's still room to play with there on one side or the other of the question. And then Galileo, you know, the word was getting around that he was condemned and excommunicated and all this stuff. And then Galileo goes to Cardinal Bellarmine. 
and says to St. Robert Bellarmine, they're saying that I've been condemned, and but you know what happened because you were there. Could you write me a little letter saying that I wasn't condemned and I wasn't made, and I wasn't declared to be a heretic for this? And Bellarmine writes it. And uh, and that he's even allowed to discuss the question within due limits. The due limits are set in the trial. You can't talk about it as a fact. You can only talk about it as a theory because it it concerns things in faith and morals. And that was the, the major concern. Well, Galileo's troubles begin again in the 1620s when he totally transgresses uh, this particular directive. And he, you know, teaches uh, Copernicanism as a, a fact makes the he writes the book in the dialogue of the world systems where he makes the pope look like an idiot and then Maffeo Barberini who now sits on the uh the papal throne as Urban the Eighth is mad because he was a big supporter of Galileo he was a big friend of Galileo and now he feels like Galileo's just stabbed him in the back so he tells the Jesuits to break out the thumb screws and go after the guy and that that's how it gets so acrimonious and bitter to the <laughs> the, the the second trial of Galileo is a Pissed off the Pope, who used to be a friend, and the Pope said, "All right, sick him, boys." Yeah. And so I mean, we could go into that. That's that's outside the scope of what we're talking about, though. So, um, so anyway, and so Bellarmine really acquitted himself well, and frankly, in some of the things like what he writes to Foscarini and others, he's actually showing him compared to what Galileo was writing at the same time, trying to mess around with Scripture. He was actually showing himself to have a better philosophy of science than Galileo did, honestly. Um, for as much as he's attacked by seculars now on the on the subject, but um, and the other thing too is Bellarmine wasn't some crusty old Aristotelian that just wouldn't accept that something's changed. Because when you look at Bellarmine's commentary on the Summa, if you can, uh, as the Jesuits got that locked away, but if you have Bellarmine's commentary on the Summa, when he's dealing with the questions that deal with the heavens, um, uh, he, he actually rejects what Aristotle and Saint Thomas say on the subject in favor of what the Greek fathers like St. Basil and others say about it. And so there's, and there's a whole number of places around the whole movement of the heavens. He follows Basil and in his interpretation of scripture in the Hexameron rather than Aristotle and St. Thomas. So, and that, that's a rare thing for Bellarmine to, to descend from St. Thomas, although he does do it at various times. And it's a, um, and, and it's a testimony too that he was open to new ideas, but he had to be able to prove it. And then we're not going to get into things with today, obviously, but um, that's that's the, the the more interesting close to that case, actually, is that, you know, he is applying the methods in the philosophy of science to the, the problem and to trying to defend doctrine in the church also. So anyway, so the Galileo episode passes and then peace is restored for a little bit. And then he finally gets he gets very sick in 1620 um, and then more so in 1621. So he's in the infirmary. Eventually the doctors order that he's no longer say his bravery. And he says, alas, I can neither say a mass nor my office. I've become a layman. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it finally, you know, passes on September 17th, uh, 1621, uh, 400 years ago. And the, that, that date is very significant. So St. Robert always had a devotion to St. Francis in his time as a cardinal giving alms with an absolute mania. He was called Il Nuovo Pavarello, the, the new St. Francis. And he had a um, a role in getting, um, in a, in, in, of course, in St. Robert Spellerman's feast day today in the, in the new mass, in the Novus Ordo mass. Um, in the traditional mass, it's not. In the traditional mass, because... Um, the, the stigmata of St. Francis is on the calendar, which it's not in the Novus Ordo. Now it's relegated to the Franciscan calendar. But in the old Roman calendar, it was on the universal calendar of the church because Bellarmine put it there. Because Bellarmine thought the whole church should rejoice in St. Francis revealing the sign of the stigmata. And so for that reason, in the traditional mass, they, the calendar, they stuck his feast day in May rather than in uh, uh, on the, the 17th. So... Um, in case anyone's wondering about that. So that was an important day to him. It was a day which we had a lot of devotion because he had always sought in his life to, to be the very image of the crucified Christ. And it just as St. Francis had that physically implanted on him. And he actually, and he says in a letter too, that he hopes that he would die on that day. He, he chose that day to die, basically. And he, and he was a man that had reached transforming union. It's also in the canonization docs that they had gathered the witness testimony. A servant was sent to fetch him and uh, he was in his cortile, walking back and forth with the rosary, praying the rosary. 
and uh, didn't even take notice of the guy. Didn't know he was there. And so, um, and he was just praying the rosary. It was like the guy's right next to him. And Bellman can't see him. He's like in another world. Like Paul talks about the third heaven. And so finally he touches him and, it, and immediately, like, like a child terrified, uh, he stopped and came to again. Right. And that, that, those are signs of transforming union, um, which a cardinal and a theologian rarely gets to. So, <laughs> especially a theologian, uh, you look at there's a lot of theologians who are so busy in the work, they're busy in the writing. It's not that they're not prayerful. It's not that they're not good men or worthy men, but very few of them actually attend to that level of sanctity. You know, And there, there's a great number of theologians that you can name that are absolutely worthy, wonderful men, um, but they don't have the, the cult around them or the testimony to this level of holiness the way that Bellarmine does. So, Or, or the other saints do, obviously, add in St. Thomas, St. Albert, St. Bonaventure, etc., um, and, and so on and so forth. So that uh, so he's laid to rest in the Jesu, actually, um, you know the the, uh, the 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 main church of the order. And there he sits for hundreds of years as the battle for his canonization rages on. And there's people who are opposed to him for one reason or another at different times as it comes up. And um, I'll have a chapter about that in my book actually to write about that some of the issues. So some of it goes back to the whole thing on efficacious grace. Some of it, um, you know, a promoter didn't like things he said. Is like, how can we make this guy sing? Because he said this and that. Um, other people, other times because of certain issues that his political philosophy caused in France, um, you know, where the, that was another issue. Um, and the, the French were opposed to Pellerman's canonization at different times for one reason or another. And then finally, Pius IX. Pius IX was ready to ramrod through that canonization. And it's going to happen. It's waited long enough. They had gone over all the testimony and everyone was agreed. And he wanted to take Bellarmine's catechism and make that the universal catechism of the Catholic Church. And Franco-Prussian War breaks out. Vatican I closes down. All these plans go to heck. They, even the, the Vatican's press is confiscated by the Masonic Italian state that, that uh, uh, carries out this revolution against the church. So that all goes away. And that just kind of sits until... Um, Benedict XV prepares the paperwork and finally Pius XI beatifies St. Robert and then canonizes him and then declares him a doctor of the church in 1935. And part of that was his program to, in the face of the ecumenical movement, and which which demands of the church denying her doctrines, as it was in 1930, by the way. I'm not going to make judgments on what's going on now, although... No, it'd be hard to guess too much what I think about it. But in those days, it was explicit that the church, all these churches need to give up their doctrines and everyone needs to come together and agree on very specific doctrines. And then we'll have unity. And Pius XI, to refute this, wrote Mortalium Animos to show that, no, the church is not going to reject who she is and her doctrines. If these people want unity with the church, we are always ready without condemnation to receive them as a loving mother. But, uh, right, and so one of the things he wanted to do was name doctors of the church who explicitly had fought Protestants to make it clear where the church is. And so he names St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Uh, Peter Canisius, the other Jesuit doctor of the church, and uh, St. Lawrence of Brindisi. Right? And he, he names all of these men doctors of the church in order to, to, to bolster his work in Mortalium Animus. And that's the principal reason that he moves in that direction. So I don't uh, know if you have any questions. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you answered the St. Francis one. I was going to go, why is St. Francis? Uh, where can find, where, you, you got, you're the, the main translator in this. I mean, anybody, that, like, I, like I brought up the one quote about Bellman, you knew exactly where it was. Where can mm -hmm. people find the books? Okay. They can find those on Mediatrix Press. So let me say a few things about that. Sorry, the camera's moving. The table's kind of rickety. So we have... Um, yeah, so I'm renumbering them. So if you've got older versions, I finally got the library science, the whole thing uh, corrected in an order. So you've got on the Roman pontiff, that's the first section of the con that I have published of the controversies. There's two preceding treatises I'm going to throw in one book and get that out uh, early next year, I think, is the best I could do on that. Um, it's already been done. That's why I'm not in a particular hardly hurry for those. Um, but anyway, so then there's the next volume, which is on the church. Um, volume two of the controversies. This doesn't say, I mean, I have Thomas three, but I'm going to organize this. So that's on councils, on the church militant, on the marks of the church. And then um, I haven't, in between, there's volumes that I haven't collected into an opera omnia yet. 
So there is uh, on purgatory that is on the church suffering. That's a standalone book. It'll probably stay as a standalone book. Uh, I'll include it in Oprah Omnia, but I won't get rid of that. Um, canonization of the saints, uh, where he goes through his various arguments, um, the infallibility of canonization, as well as what, um, you know, th that canonization is not apotheosis like the Roman gods. We're not putting people up as gods. All the apologetic arguments against the Protestants uh, is really good stuff. So then um, the first volumes on the sacraments, um, on the sacraments in general, on baptism and confirmation. So that's what I got in print from the controversies, as well as oh, one more I forgot. On the Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and this is actually one of my favorite books to have done, um, there's places that whenever he deals with the ceremonies, it's, it's actually rather amusing. So Calvin or Luther will make some argument against the ceremonies that the church uses in Mass. And I'll almost fall out of my chair because the arguments that Calvin and Luther use, are a lot of them, are the very same ones that uh, left-leaning Catholic liturgists have been using in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Surprise. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so then I have, uh, especially in honor of today's feast, the autobiography of St. Robert Bellarmine. Now, I just put the warning out there so you know. The autobiography is very short. I, I try to expand the stuff out as much as I could. I added pictures. But the autobiography itself only goes about 40, about 51 pages. Um, and it was it was never meant to be like a real in-depth autobiography. Um, and he, you know, he, he basically, some Jesuits asked him for a little account of his life. And so he writes down just little notes that, that seemed important to him to give these guys an, an idea about his life, right? So that's uh, so that's that. And then on top of it, I have some appendixes explaining some of the history stuff. And I added some sermons, um, including the sermon that was uh, the most dear of all his sermons, his sermon on the Annunciation. And so, the, you know, so I added that to the book just to add some more paper to it um, instead of have this, you know, 50 page thing and then call it good. Just give you a little bit more. And right? you got his catechism. And I've got it. That was the next point. The last one I was going to mention, I also have his catechism. And uh, as I mentioned, too, I'm going to be opening up pre-ordering on um, uh, The Ascent of the Mind of God by the Ladder of Things Created. It's a wonderful aesthetical book. It's a great book to take to adoration. It's a great book to take, um, you know, wherever. Hopefully by the end of the year, there's going to be another one um, uh, called A Retreat with St. Robert Bellarmine. Now it's selected. Uh, conferences that he gives to his Jesuit brethren and only lightly edited to be basically be, um, you know, or just basically going to remove things where he addresses the, you know, his Jesuit brothers specifically. And it's just going to be, you know, to be more broadly, because most of what he says is broadly applicable to everybody. And so we're taking in you know, a 15, 16, something of those conferences and put those out there um, or divide it up. Maybe I get to a whole month or something. I don't know. We'll see what the <clears throat> the work lends itself to. Uh, again, something you can take with you to adoration, something you do for your Lexio Divina, your meditation, um, or what have you. And so, I mean, there's a reason why he's a doctor of the church and reason why he's a saint. It's not merely for that particular political end. God wanted him glorified. And that's why in every generation from his death, uh, the cause was always being reintroduced. Usually you give up. After about 100, 200 years, you give up. Um, and, and they kept going. Are you going to get the uh, scripture one, or is that uh, a no-go? Yeah, the scripture, and uh, so, so let's talk about the controversy. So the controversies are divided uh, into four volumes. The first volume is, is on scripture, that is on tradition, on, on this, the word of God, written and unwritten. So obviously the written word is scripture, the unwritten word is tradition. The next one is on Christ, and, and, and basically Christ is the head of the church. So I mean, apart from dealing with select questions in Christology, it also deals with uh, whether Christ, you know, could Christ is the judge of controversies. And yes, but not as he was on earth. He does that through his vicar. So that's the next volume that I already held up on the papacy. Um, and they'll be colored the same as the, the one on the papacy. They'll, they'll be in one volume, I think, uh, on scripture and on Christ. And then this one on the Pope. And then um, everything on the church is going to be blue. Everything in the sacraments, gold. And then I haven't decided yet for when I get to the last part. So, um, yeah, after the papacy one, it goes to um, councils, church militant, marks of the church. Then there's uh, some volumes I passed over on clergy, on the, on the monks, that is on religious life it, itself. Um, and finally, um, on, on the laity, the De Laetis has been in translation for a long time. So that's another reason I wasn't motivated to get on that section on the specific members of the church, because I'm trying to avoid 
redoing what's already been done uh, for the most part. Then there's um, the sacraments. Obviously, the, the, the sacraments in general you can get in, the, in this book. So it's gold one. Uh, baptism and confirmation, defending those sacraments. The next one after that's the Eucharist. That's going to be a massive book. And then I'll reincorporate the treatise in the mass and the end of it. Um, pen- penance, indulgences, because that's connected to penance. And then the last three, extreme unction, matrimony, and, and order, right? So then it goes to the final section on the economy of salvation. So that's on the the original sin itself, which actually is an excellent treatise because original sin is one of those subjects that most people today, haven't, including theologians, haven't the faintest idea what they're talking about when they start addressing original sin. And, and usually they're too worried about making nice. So the Orthodox don't accept that. And it, we have defined, formally defined teaching on what original sin is. And you can barely find people that can even enunciate what's in the catechism that, that, that is the CCC, you know, uh, which just follows the tradition largely. So, um, but, but anyways, Bellarmine has a long treatise on that, defending that against the Protestants. And then uh, grace, de grazia, which is, you know, grace is always one of those complicated subjects. I always hate getting in that discussion because I'm, you know, I, I've read through Bellarmine's de grazia and made notes, you know, which I'll go back to when I go to translate it, but it's not, a subject that I know extremely well. So we're always making mistakes because there's so many different complicated Latin terms for all these different types of grace, you know, and what they mean in these technical terms. And so that's um, not a subject that lends itself rather easily. That's why I've got a nice big chart of them all. So then when I get to De Grazia, that's going to be easy work going through it. But, um, and then finally there's uh, justification, which uh, actually no, it's not finally, that's the second one, but that, and people have asked me to translate that by itself and I haven't done it, because so much of the so many of the distinctions there are absolutely dependent on what he's already said in um, the loss of grace in the first man and on on grace, and so it would be, it would be not good. It couldn't work as a standalone because there's so much that's missing, right? So I don't want to get into that. And then lastly is the value of good works, which is a big thing with the Protestants. They don't believe any works of any kind are good. And so Bellarmine shows why good works are valuable, but not by themselves like this Pelagian construct. Rather. Uh, works of faith are valuable things that God has asked for. And so um, anyway, so that's the controversy. So I've got, you know, a, a lot, I've got various sections that are partially translated that I'm still drawing together. I took a hiatus after my daughter died and I'm not trying to use that as, Oh, I couldn't do it. I mean, I think we've said that before in another program, but it just, um, it just slowed me down and it took a um, long time for me to get back in the saddle and get, get working on it. Same thing with the Alphonsus, which, Volume three, I'm hoping to see done. It's got to be done this year. I've got to get it because it's been so long. But that was another one I took a hiatus from. So that's why I'm moving, you know, now to get a lot of different, uh, pull all these things together and just get it done. Come on, man. It's such a simple, yeah, man. Come on. You can bust that out on the weekend. I don't know what you're yeah, right? about over there. Yeah, and, and I'm getting older. I just can't <laughs> do it as fast as I did, ten, you know, five years ago, six years ago. So we said we would only go for about 15 minutes. And I know, no. Nah, if yeah. I was, if, <laughs> If anybody knows if, when Ryan and I get together on, or if he does a project, I'll tell him, dude, let it rip. So there was no way I could put any strings on him to hold him down to chain him up on this. So glad you ripped, glad you did what you did. And uh, any final thoughts on uh, Bella before we wrap it up? Um, yeah, I mean, the, too many and not enough. Uh, Bellerman's just uh, just an outstanding author in so many different ways, and he is. Um, it's like, what couldn't I say about him? You know, and, uh, you know, it's someone that really deserves to be known more about in the church. And especially for, um, it's why, that's why I'm, you know, I've been writing a new biography on him. It's a popular biography and that, that'll also be on Mediatrix Express when it's done. Um, the, the, there's, again, it's like, there's, you, you get someone who's so accomplished, so brilliant, um, and, and also so holy, right? He was at the, the service of so many popes, almost elected pope himself, um, you know, has been in, in the mix of a number of major events in the world, uh, the, the world-changing events sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, the Sixth French War of Religion being stuck over during the Siege of Paris, or again in, um, you know, the Galileo, right? I mean, major major issues and conflicts that that he's been drawn to the midst of and in every single thing he did he was always utterly concerned for for the salvation of souls getting people to heaven 
you know, dealing with you know, people's wants, people who are suffering, you know, making, um, you know, fixing their suffering and uh, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I just can't say enough that that in, in every different level, he's he's a saint for every man, you know, and he's not, um, apart from his, his prophecy and foretelling the future, um, you know, he's not a, you know, this character walking around doing miracles like um, Pascal Balon or uh, uh, was the one he did the podcast on the other day um, in France that was uh, just miracles all over all the place. Leo yeah, Leo Dupont. You know, it's um, he's like it's not not doesn't have miracles flowing from everything he does, and yet, um, you know, so in life, apart from that prophecy, there's there's nothing particularly you know amazing except that just the grace are his human gifts. But at the same, and that's why too, he's he's all the more should be all the more appealing to us actually, because uh, some saints, as Saint Francis de Sales says, are to, and, and actually, and I, through all that rant and all these hours. I never even mentioned St. Robert Bellarmine's great friendship with St. Francis de Sales. Go ahead, throw him in. That, uh, uh, well, I mean, he met Francis de Sales because then he was on a committee to judge the worthiness of candidates to be made a bishop. And Francis de Sales had been a priest laboring in uh, Geneva for some time, um, doing all this work. He'd read St. Robert Bellarmine's work, um, and he, he boasted the fact that when he would sneak in, he would take with him nothing but the Bible and Bellarmine's controversies and, um, you know, for reading. And so then he meets the great Bellarmine when he has uh, been appointed to become the new bishop of Geneva. And, and they become very fast friends, and they have a very lengthy correspondence that, again, you can find in Bachelet. I don't think it's published anywhere, um, where, you know, Francis de Sales having problems, Francois de Sales, we're going to say his name properly, but um, he uh, he's having problems with, uh, you know, nuns, a convent of nuns that seem to be unruly and thought he'd reform them. And now they're having this issue. Bellarmine gives him advice on how to deal with that, how to take care of that issue. Where again, uh, other concerns, pastoral concerns, he's right about really deep stuff, you know, and Bellarmine answers him in kind. They have a, a very strong friendship in Kendall, even though they only actually physically met, I think two, two, three times in their lives. Um, so it's, uh, it is, it's actually funny that so many books that are written on the Counter-Reformation, they do so much about St. Francis de Sales, but they never mention Bellarmine. Even though it's his writings that that uh, Saint Francis de Sales drew on, and the two were great friends, you know. And it's like, and you look at the work of Bellarmine; um, few were more uh, influential, actually, in turning the tide against Protestantism that that was then you know happening in Europe, really, than Bellarmine and his work. So, it um, not just being useful for the advancement of Catholic theology in general, as apologetic work, it's furnished every single argument they use today, just about. Yeah, that was a, that was the book, uh, The Gentleman's Saint. I remember reading that. I was blown away. And went, that yeah, that was, was really cool. The, my good friend, I only want these three books, this, this, and my cut the controversy, my good friend, Robert Bellamy. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, like Dr. Church telling you to read the Doctor of Church. Eh. <laughs> good yeah. advice. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> MediatrixPress.com. It will be underneath in the show notes when Ryan sends the uh, uh, pre-order. I'll put it up as a post on YouTube as well. It will be underneath too. Just click underneath everything you need. If you want to contact Ryan, check out the webpage, MediatrixPress.com, and uh, hit him up for any kind of – you do lectures at par parishes too, right? Uh, if we can get around the current measures of the unspecified uh, virus of unspecified origin – uh then then uh yeah if that's if that's possible then um i will in fact i will be in dallas uh well not properly dallas irving right in the diocese of dallas fort worth october 8th and october 9th to talk kind of like we did here uh -huh. a little more in depth on certain things broken up into smaller sections uh, for you to handle uh, and there'll be refreshments served it'll be after mass friday and saturday there'll be mass first there'll be refreshments there'll be uh, lunch provided on Saturday, I think. I'm going to be with four different talks in Bellarmine's life. Um, and I'll have books there to buy. So if you're in that area down in uh, the Lone Star State, I will be there October 8th and 9th. And so you can contact them for more uh, info. Yes. All right, man. We'll see you tomorrow. Appreciate you. All right.